What is the truth about Jesus Christ? That is the question we will be tackling today. And my hope today is that you see the whole truth and nothing but the truth about Jesus Christ, as well as see the truth and who Jesus Christ really is today. Now, let me preface this and say, do I believe in the New Testament? Yes, I do. Do I believe in the Messiah that is spoken of in the New Testament? Yes, I do. I believe that the Messiah not only died, but he was also resurrected and atoned for my sins. I do believe that. However, I do not believe it the way Christianity teaches. I do not believe it the way religion teaches it. And you're going to see that scripture agrees with me and so does the King James Version. And you're going to also see that the King James Version, Jesus is not even the name of the Messiah in the King James Version. Don't believe me? You will after this. Because the truth will be revealed today. Now, what you're looking at is the cover from the 1611 version of the King James Version. Yes, the 1611 edition of the King James Version, the very first version. Yes, the very first version of the King James Version. Let me repeat that. And the reason I'm here is because I'm showing you the actual cover. And as you can see, the cover even contains the name of our father, the Hebrew name for our father, Yahuwah. But when you look at the actual cover, this is what you see. So it says the Holy Bible containing the Old Testament and the New. But as you can see, the word containing isn't spelled like it's normally spelled today. And you can even see the word original is not spelled the way it is either. And when you look at this version, you start to notice something very interesting and suspicious about it. Indeed, because when you look at this word majesties, there is a letter that is not there. And that letter is the letter J, which we will be talking about and covering even and more but this is just the covering that I want you to see as you can see 1611 and we're going to go to the actual table of contents and we're actually going to be reading from this version so that you can see the truth for yourself and so that you can be deceived no more now, upon first looking at this version, the very first thing you see about the 1611 version in the King James Version, and yes, this is the King James Version. This is the original King James Version that they used, the very first one. As you can see, here's the table of contents, but you start to notice something. You start to notice that some of the wordings and the way that they used to spell words back then, 400 years ago, is not how they spell words today. As you can see, it says the names and order of all the books of the Old and New Testament with the number of their chapters. Well, books isn't spelled like that today. And when you look at some of the chapters, they're not spelled like the way we spell it today either. For example, Deuteronomy is spelled with an I-E instead of a Y in this version, but there's something else. There is a letter that is missing that is not here. Because when you look at Joshua or what is commonly known as Joshua in this version, there is no letter J in this version. When you look at Jeremiah, there is no letter J. It is only a letter I. When you look at the book of Job, there is no letter J. It is only the letter I. And this book also contains the Apocrypha, which is books that they've taken out of Scripture in newer versions of the King James Version to keep you enslaved to just the 66 books and also to keep these books hidden from you because they don't want you to know the true history. But that's another topic for another video. But I just wanted to show you and let you know that when you look at this version, and we're going to actually look at it, even the book of John, there is no letter J. It's a letter I right there. Where is that coming from? Where is the letter J? I've said before, and I will continue to say, the truth will be revealed to you today. And like I said earlier, we're going to be reading out of the original 1611 King James Version Bible so that you can be deceived no more. Because we're here in Yahuhanan, or John chapter 5, in the original King James Version, the very very first one back in 1611, the one they used not even 400 years ago. And as you're going to see, you're going to see something very interesting and suspicious indeed, especially when it comes to the name of our Messiah. Now it says, it even asks you, why does it have strange spelling? Well, you can look it up more on that. And I highly recommend you all check this out on your own time so that you can be deceived no more. But as you see, they use the archaic English or the old middle English back then during that time. And as you see in the actual scripture itself, 
you see that in the King James Version itself that what? There is no letter J whatsoever. The letter J is nowhere to be found. As you can see, it says after this, there was a feast of what should save the Jews in the original King James. Well, in the 1611 Version, it has the letter I. And by the way, the letters I and J were originally pronounced as the letter Y. So the Y sound. And you can see right here the name of the Messiah. What? It says, instead of saying Jesus, it says it with an I or Isus or Yesus as another way of pronouncing that. And as you can see, the spelling is different. This is how they originally spelled it. But there's no letter J. Can somebody tell me where the letter J is in this version? And if you look here, you'll even see that there is no letter J right there. And even verse 6 too even says, what? No letter J right there whatsoever. So if you keep going and if we keep going, when we see the name of the Messiah, you see that what? No letter J. It's spelled with a letter I. And this chapter is all talking about searching the scriptures, which is what we are doing. As you can see in verse 8, there is no letter J. His name is spelled with an I. You will not find the letter J at all in these scriptures whatsoever. So the question is, why is it there in today's King James Version if it wasn't even there in the 1611 Version? And then we have right here for the Jews, or the word that's commonly known as the Jews in verse 10, we don't see the letter J there either either. It's spelled differently, and they spelled it differently too. In verse 13, we still don't see the letter J either. In verse 14, there is no letter J right there. It's all the letter I, and we see that here, the letter I and the letter I right there. As we can see here, we see it again there, we see it again there. I'm just trying to give you a better idea and a better mental picture of this so that you can see how words were spelled differently back then. Even the word son was spelled differently back then so that you can see that there was no letter J and that I'm not making this up. So then the question you should be thinking about is if there was no letter J in the King James Version 400 years ago, and I've just proven to you with the actual King James Version itself that there was no letter J 400 years ago, then why is our Messiah's name spelled with a letter J? Because I'm here in the book of John or Yahuchanan chapter 5 verses 43 and once again we're here in the 1611 King James Version and it says I am come in my father's name and you receive me not if another shall come in his own name him ye will receive. Why am I talking about this verse and why is this verse so important is because the Messiah himself tells us that he comes in his father's name and of course if you look at this version you see that they spell the word receive differently they spell it with the U instead of a V back then. I'm telling you, and they also spell believe differently back then too. I wonder why that's the case because it's different English. Like I said, no letter J in this version at all. You're not going to find the letter J. So then why is our Messiah spelled with the name of the letter J if that's not even his name, if the, the letter J is not even in the scriptures whatsoever as I've just proven today. And you can look at this more on your own time. So you may be wondering then, well, what's the father's name? What name is he coming in and our names really important that's something that we will be tackling as well today because I'm here in Psalms or Tahalim chapter 68 verses 4 where we can actually find the name of our father and we'll see exactly what the Messiah himself is talking about. Now like I said when you look at the original 1611 KJV you're not going to find the letter J whatsoever in scripture at all. Why? Well, I'm going to tell you why and we're going to go over more of the letter J in the history of the letter J in just a second but right now we're going to go over names and why they're so important. So we're in the book of Psalms chapter 68 and as you can see it even says the rejoicing but hey the rejoicing there is no letter J right there interesting isn't it but we're going to be reading from verses 4 where it says and of course this is a truth network so we do is we restore the set apart Hebrew names for our father Yahuwah and his true son Yahusha and I'm going to go over that more in just a second with you but as you can see it says sing unto Elohim another way to pronounce Elohim is Allahim sing praises to his name, extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name Yah, because remember the letter I and the letter J back then were pronounced as the letter Y, so name Yah and rejoice before him. Again, no letter J right there. But as you see, and you'll see in the KJV today, that instead of I-A-H, it's spelled J-A-H. But like I said, it's pronounced Y-A-H or Yah or Yahuwah. Why is that so important? It's because when you understand the names and the origin of names, then you start to understand why all of this is so important. 
Because what you start to find out is that names are so important indeed. And for those of you who are still saying, oh, but the Lord knows my heart and that, oh, names don't really matter and that, oh, it doesn't matter. We can call them whatever we want. And, oh, it's it's okay to call them whatever we want. And, oh, we can't learn the Hebrew because the Hebrew has been done away with. I suggest you seriously wake up, think again, and do not be deceived and just know who you're calling on, who you're calling upon, and what name you're using and what that name really means because I'm here and I'm showing you I come in my father's name and you do not receive me if another comes in his own name him you would receive and this is of course quoting Yahukanan or John chapter 5 verses 43 this is the Messiah saying that now as you can see the Messiah's name in the Hebrew is Yahusha and our father's name right here is Yahuwah that is the restored set apart Hebrew name that this channel is dedicated to restoring now the reason this is so important and the reason the Hebrew is so important is because when you look at the Hebrew you see the father's name and the Messiah's name you see the father's name Yah or Yahu according to Psalms chapter 68 verses 4 which we just read you see that right there in his own name and why is that so important is because think about it this way my name is Chris and that is my name but if I go to any other nation if I go to any other country whether it be Spain Portugal Greece wherever my name is still Chris regardless where I am regardless of the country I'm in regardless of the language I'm speaking and I've talked about this in many other of my videos that is still my name yes I know the Spanish equivalent of my name is crystal ball however if somebody calls me crystal ball or if somebody approaches me and calls me crystal ball I'm not going to respond because that is not my name and so many people try to say that oh well it's okay to call the Messiah Jesus, it's okay to call the Messiah that because it's the English equivalent, it's the Greek equivalent, and oh, it's from the Latin, and oh, well, the Messiah knows my heart, so it's okay. No, if you call him that, he's not going to answer you, he's not going to respond because that is not his name. His name is in the Hebrew, he has a Hebrew name, so therefore, it would only make sense to call him by his Hebrew name. And for those of you who still think it's a cult and think that, oh, it doesn't matter, I seriously suggest you wake up and understand language and because when you understand language and when you understand how much things have been hidden from you then you start to understand exactly the bigger agenda and how they don't want you to know who your father is they don't want you to know who your creator is they don't want you to know who your messiah is they don't want you to know this stuff and they don't want you to have a relationship with your father it's time to wake up now and see the truth and stop being deceived and stop being lied to by religion by the church by your pimp and pastor because I bet you still tithe. It's time to seriously wake up to the stuff and see the truth that is right in front of you. And this is why the language is so important. This is why the Hebrew is so important. And for those of you who still want to sit here and say that, oh, it doesn't matter, I honestly don't know what to tell you. But for those of you who are seeking truth and authentically seeking truth and want to know the real name of our Father and the real name of our Messiah, well, then here it is. Because here I am showing you the actual Hebrew. And yes, I'm showing you the yod Hey and the vav Hey. Another way to pronounce that is the yod Hey. Uhe for our father, and that's where you get Yahuwah, and for the Messiah, it's Yod He Vav, and then the Shin Ayin, and that is where you get Yahusha. And as you can see right here in the Hebrew itself, not only does it match scripture, and not only does it match what the Messiah said in John chapter 5, verses 43, when he says that he comes in his father's name, because you see right here that both in their names they have what? They have the same characters. They have what? The Yod, the He, and the Vav, or the U right here so they have the Yahoo and their names right there and they're not the only ones and remember like I said earlier too that Lord and God are not names. It's time that we get that in our heads and just get that concept that yes, Lord and God are not names. They are titles. That is what they are. And if you look up what the word Lord means in the Hebrew, you know why you should not use it for the name of our Father because they are titles and they are not names. But as you see, this actually matches what Scripture is talking about. But the name Jesus doesn't even come close. Where do you see Yah or Yah? Yahoo in the name in Jesus. Where do you see that? The answer is you do not because that is not the name of our Messiah. And I'm trying to get that through your head. Hopefully you're seeing it with both your eyes open.
Because what you will find is that many of the prophets that are spoken of in the Old Testament, all of them have the names Yah or Yahu in their names. And this is why names are so important. And this is why the Hebrew is so important. But what man has done is that he has not only Hellenized these names and Anglicized them and removed the Hebrew and took out the Hebrew from scripture itself, but he has replaced them with English names to no effect and has then said, oh, it's okay to use these these English names and you bought right into the deception because I'm showing you real truth right now that says names of books of the scripture and as you can see Joshua's real name is Yahusha which means Yahuwah is salvation and we're going to go over more of Joshua later on but as you can see I'm not going to go over all of these I just wanted to show you this I'll leave the link below so you can see it but you can also see Isaiah his real name is Yasha Yahu which means salvation is Yahuwah and notice how for Isaiah you, you have the Shah root, which is the root of salvation, and you also see that in the Messiah's name too, uh, with different variations and different spellings, of course. But if you look at Obadiah, you see that his real name is Obadiahu, which is the servant of Yahuwah. If you look at Zephaniah, you have Safan Yahu, which is the secret of Yahuwah. If you look at Zechariah, you have Zakar Yahu, which means Yahuwah remembers. If you look at Job, you have Yashub, which means Yahuwah will return. If you look at Nehemiah, you have what? Naham Yahu, which means consoled by Yahuwah. Even if you look at Matthew, which means Matit Yahu, it means what? The gift is Yahuwah. So you see Yahuwah is right there in all of their names. But see, they want you to think that, oh, the Hebrew doesn't matter and that, oh, it's only the English that matters. And I'm going to let you know how this plays a bigger role into the deception because yes, as I've just proven today, names do in fact matter and they have a big big role to do with all of this and my hope is that you're seeing that today and my hope is that you're seeing just where salvation really comes from as the truth will be revealed today and somebody's going to get this now I'm here at the online etymology dictionary and what we're going to be covering right now is the origins of the letter J because like I said if the letter J is only a few hundred years old and if we've just proven earlier ago that the King James Version itself there was no letter J in there then how is the name of our Messiah Jesus when there was no letter J 400 years ago, let alone 2,000 years ago? And it's time we see that and understand that. Now it says, and I'm here at the etymology dictionary itself, but it says, the letter J, the 10th letter of the English alphabet, pronounced J as in K for K, but formerly written out as JY, rhyming with I and corresponding to French, J. One of the most stable English letters, it has almost always the same sound, it is a late comer to the alphabet and to be exact it's the newest letter of the alphabet the last letter to be added and originally had no sound value the letter itself began as a scribal modification of Roman I and continental medieval Latin. The scribes added a hook to small I, especially in the final position in a word or Roman numeral to distinguish it from the strokes of other letters. The dot on the I and thus the J in the capitalization of the pronoun I are other solutions to the same problems. Now this is the important part and you will see in English J was used as a Roman numeral throughout Middle English but the letter Y was used to spell words ending an I sound so J was not needed to represent a sound and that's something we went over and when we saw Psalm 64 and we saw our father's name being spelled in the original KJV as I-A-H well that I was pronounced as a letter Y and you'll see in the KJV today in Psalm 64 that our father's name is spelled Yah or J-A-H but it's not pronounced as J it's pronounced as a Y but it goes on to say instead it is in the letter J was introduced in to English circa 1600 to 1640 to take up the consonantal sound that had evolved from the Roman I since late Latin times. In Italian, G was used to represent this, but in other languages, J took the job. This usage is attested earliest in Spanish where it was in place before 1600. No word beginning with J is of old English derivation. And that's something we just went over too because I just taken you to the 1611 version of 
of the KJV and you saw no letter J or no word containing the letter J because it simply did not exist because it was introduced into the English circa 1600 to 1640. Well, guess what? In the 1611 version, there was no letter J whatsoever. So how can that be the name of the Messiah when, when history even proves that that is simply not the case when the KJV even proves that it's simply not the case. The etymology goes on to talk about the Latin text and the Latin origins of the letter J and then the character J, but what's also interesting is it talks about the Hebrew and even brings up the Hebrew as well because it says, in English words from Hebrew, J represents Yod, which was equivalent to the English consonantal Y, hence hallelujah, but many of the Hebrew names later were conformed to in sound to the modern J compared Jesus, and we're going to be going over the etymology of the word Jesus too, and just where that name really comes from, and how that name has been transliterated from the Latin, the Greek, the Aramaic, and then the Hebrew. Why all of those transliterations throughout history? You're going to see a bigger deception throughout all of this, but the reason I'm talking about this is because just as I said earlier, what? It was equivalent to the letter Y. It was equivalent to the sound Y, and hence hallelujah, and we went over all of the different names of the prophets earlier and how they all had Yah and Yah Yahu in their names actually. Well, when you look at the word hallelujah, the highest praise, what does it sound does it make? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. What does that mean in the English? It means praise be to Yah. That is what that means, but your pastor won't tell you that, will he? Just like he probably won't tell you the origins of the word Jesus or just like he probably won't even tell you that tithing has nothing to do with money and everything to do with food and I've even done a video on this but I'm here at the American Heritage Dictionary and the reason I'm here is because I want to tell you the origins and the etymology of the word Jesus and where this word really comes from because the question we should be thinking about is if the letter J did not exist 400 years ago how is this the name of my, the Messiah where did this come from? So it says, according to this, and you're going to see that Jesus, quote, Jewish religious leader who was crucified in Jerusalem after his teaching and reported miracle working incurred the disfavor of the Roman governor of Palestine. In Christianity, Jesus is seen as the Christ and as the Son of God. Now, this is, of course, the definition that they give, but the, the etymology of Jesus is Middle English from the late Latin Isus or Jesus, from the Greek Isus, and from the Hebrew Yeshua or from Yahosua, this is what they're telling us, Joshua, see Joshua. Now you may be wondering, why does it say see Joshua right there? Because when you look at the Hebrew, Joshua and the Messiah, they have the same name. They have the exact same name in the Hebrew. So the question is, if they have the same name in the Hebrew, why is it that they have two different names in the English? Why is that the question? Now, the online etymology dictionary also reiterates some of the things that we've been talking about from the American Heritage Dictionary. And as you can see, it comes from late Latin Iesus, or properly pronounced as three syllables, from the Greek Isus, which is an attempt to render into Greek the Aramaic proper name Yeshua, or from the Aramaic Hebrew Yeshua or Yahshua, from the later form of the Hebrew Yahoshua, which of course they tell us also to see salvation, which is, comes from the form Yah is salvation. Now, as you can see, it comes from all of these different places. It comes from the Latin, it originates from the Greek, it originates from the Aramaic, and then all the way back to the Hebrew. So one has to wonder why all of these different translations and variations. Who were the ones who did all of this? Who were the ones responsible for Hellenizing and Anglicizing the name of our Messiah to get rid of the Hebrew altogether, as I've just talked about earlier ago? What is the bigger deception here? Now, briefly, I would like to go over IHS, and there's a reason we're going over this, because later on in this video, I'm going to be telling you the origins of the name Jesus and where that name really comes from and what that name really means in the Greek and in the Latin, as well as telling you the name Yeshua and what that name means too. But as you see in the IHS, it's Old English from the Medieval Latin representing Greek abbreviation of Isus, which means Jesus, in which the character H is the capital of the Greek vowel eta. And the Roman word would be I-E-S, mistaken for a Latin contraction in the Middle Ages after its Greek origin was forgotten. And in slang, you can see it means Jesus H. Christ. 
Why is this so important? And what does this have to do with anything? You're gonna find out more in just to come. We have gone over a brief history of the etymology of the word Jesus, as well as the etymology of the letter J. And we've already discussed, and I've already shown you and proven to you in the 1611 King James Version itself, that Jesus can't possibly be the name of our Messiah because the letter J simply did not exist back then, let alone 2000 years ago. Now we're going to cover more of Jesus and we're going to see exactly if it lines up with scripture and if it matches scripture. Because remember, the Messiah comes in the name of his father. Well, Jesus doesn't have the name Yah in it at all whatsoever. So therefore, that cannot possibly be his name. Now I'm showing you this image of Jesus Christ. I'm showing you a Russian icon of him. But I start to see some very interesting things about this. Because what if I told you that the Messiah himself, the real Real Messiah is not white whatsoever and I have scripture to back this up as well what if I told you that there is something very interesting about this picture and if you've seen my mark of the beast video you know exactly what this symbol means and if you see my image of the beast video you know what this hand gesture represents too and you know that another figure makes this hand gesture as well and if you have not and if you don't know you're gonna know today because I'm going to prove that and show you what it's talking about today. So we're back in the King James Version itself, the original 1611 version where there is no letter J at all. And you can do more research on this on your own time, but we're here and I'm going to show you this and I'm going to show you how the real Messiah looks according to scripture itself. So we're in Revelation chapter one and we're going to be going to verses 13 and 15. And as you can see, where is the letter J? It ain't there because it did not exist back then but as you can see it says and in the midst of the seven candlesticks and you can see the spelling is a little different one like unto the son of man clothed with the garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle his head and his hairs were like white like wool as white as snow and his eyes were as a flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters okay well let's look at that so according to revelation chapter 1 verses 14 his head and his hairs were like white wool as white as snow so if they were like white wool well the jesus christ that you see does that depict white wool no it does not and it also says in verse 15 that his feet like unto fine brass as if they were burned in a furnace well that description if you burn brass into a furnace it's going to come out very dark so therefore the messiah is dark skin according to scripture itself. Here is a more accurate depiction and picture of our Messiah, of the real Messiah, Yahusha, as described in scripture itself, as described in the book of Revelation itself. And as you can see, he has what? White woolly hair, as scripture describes, and also what? Feet unto fine brass as if burned in a furnace. That's talking about what? Dark black skin. Yes, the real biblical Israelites were and are black people. Yes, that is correct. I've even done a video on this please check it out so that you will not be deceived anymore so now that we know how the real messiah really looks according to scripture itself and we've even proven that with scripture itself in the book of revelation itself how the messiah really looks and even the book of daniel or daniel chapter 10 verses 6 and even chapter 7 verses 9 even tells you how our father looks well now that we know that and now that we have scriptural evidence to back it up and not our own opinions well then where does the false white image come in? Because if you've seen my image of the beast video, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, here is another picture of Russian icons that depict what? The Messiah, Yahusha, whom the world knows as Jesus, being black indeed. And as you can see, it even has the Greek symbol right there. And if you've seen my Mark of the Beast video, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But even in this image depicted, he holds up that same hand gesture. Huh, where else have I seen that?
Here are some more Russian icons that are depicted. And like I said, I go into more detail with this and I delve into more of this in my Who Are the Real Biblical Israelites Part 1 video, which I highly recommend you watch if you have not already seen it. And as you can see, it depicts what? The Black Messiah once again. And you see this right here. And once again, what hand gesture is he holding up? It's like in every image depicted of him. By the way, all of these images are abominable because they break the second commandment. But anyway, what does he hold? up but he's always holding up that hand gesture it's just like we cannot get away from that hand gesture here's another russian icon depicted of the messiah and as you can see what color is he i'll let you answer that yourself so then you may be wondering if the messiah is in fact black and has dark skin and white woolly hair and that is according to the book of revelation the book of hazun the book of, of revelation itself it is according to scripture itself you may be wondering how did the messiah become white and anglicized and how did the messiah become anglicized and whitewashed well i'll tell you how because they they painted him white. And here's an actual picture showing you that the Messiah was painted by who? The synagogues of Satan. And I go over more of this in my Who Are the Real Biblical Israelites video. And I also cover and talk about Revelation chapter 2 verses 9 and Revelation chapter 3 verses 9. And I also talk about the hidden history, how the synagogues of Satan, those who call themselves the real Jews but are not, how they not only painted over the real pictures, but they also hired painters to do it as well. And that is how they have been transformed from this to this that is how they went from black to white and even first maccabees chapter 3 talks about that a book that they had to remove from scripture so that you would not know the truth but now that you see it you are awakened to truth and you know exactly where the real deception comes from and where the image of jesus christ really comes from i also went over this in my image of the beast video and i highly recommend you watch it if you already haven't but briefly I I went over Cesare Borgia, which is where you get the false image of the white Jesus Christ, because we've just proven with scripture itself that the Messiah looks nothing like this according to the book of Revelation. But in that video, I not only went over the image of the beast, but I also went over and identified with you the beast who is the Roman Catholic Church that is spoken of as the first beast in Revelation or Hazun chapter 13. And I also told you and talked about how the image of the beast has to do with the Roman Catholic Church and has to do something with papal Rome and the papacy. Well, when you look up Cesare Borgia, which is the man to the left that you're currently looking at, when you look this man up, you will see that he was the son of a pope and you will see that this is where you get the image of the false image of Jesus Christ. Not only that, but you'll see that he had a gay lover who painted images of himself, which also gave you what? The depiction of the false image of the white Jesus. By the way, this is a very Masonic hand gesture because this man did some very evil things. And this is who you idolize, idolatry, I see. But now that you know the truth, you, the truth will make you free and you will be deceived no more. So then, you are probably wondering then if the Messiah's name is not even Jesus because we've even proven that with the 1611 King James Version and if he's not that white image that you see plastered all over the place, which is abominable by the way, you're probably wondering and asking yourself, was he really nailed to the cross and does scripture really say that he was nailed to the cross? Very interesting and suspicious indeed because we're going to be talking about this too. We're going to be covering this too and we're going to be using the King James Version itself so that you can see how the real Messiah actually died and so that you can see how he was actually hung on a tree and had nothing to do with the cross but so that you can also see where the cross really originates from and how the cross is the worship of Tammuz and how the cross has nothing to do with the real Messiah. Don't believe me? Stay tuned. So we're back here in Afsim or Acts chapter 5 and we're going to be reading from verses 30 because I want you to see the truth for yourself and I want you to be deceived no more and rather than listen to me or listen to a pastor I want you to seek scripture for yourself so that you can see the truth 
for yourself. And we're here in verses 30. And there's a reason for this. And there's a reason I'm in the 1611 version again, because it says in this version, according to this, the Allahim or God of our fathers raised up Yahusha or Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Yes, the King James version actually says this. And today's King James version also says this as well, that what? Whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Yes, scripture itself says that. But this is isn't the only place where it says it. We are once again in the original 1611 King James Version, and we're going to be reading from Offscene or Acts chapter 10 so that we can get a better understanding of how the real Messiah really died according to Scripture itself. And as you can see, the letter J is not in the King James Version, the very original one whatsoever. But we're here in verses 39. And this is the verse that I want to turn your attention to because it says in Acts chapter 10, verses 39, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of what should, of what would say Jews and in Jerusalem, no letter J whatsoever, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. And yes, you will find this in the original King James Version as well. Open up your King James Version and actually turn to these scriptures and you will find it there that what? Whom they slew and hanged on a tree. With what? The truth is right in front of you. It's time to wake up and stop making excuses. It says slew and hanged on a tree. I know you have a lot of questions and I know you have a lot that's on your mind and you're probably wondering why the word cross is even in scripture to begin with, especially in Matthew chapter 16 verses 24. We're going to tackle that and more to come. But I'm also here in Acts or Avsim chapter 13, and we're going to be reading from verses 29, and we're going to see what that says as well. And we're going to be reading from verses 29. So we're here in Acts chapter 13, verses 29. And it says, And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. So what did they do? And there were witnesses for this, by the way. They did what? They took him down from the tree. It does not say that they took him down from the cross. It doesn't say that he was nailed to the cross. It says that they took him down from the tree. So where's all this cross stuff coming from? But we're just getting started. There's still more to go. There's still plenty of more to talk about. Now I've gone over all of this in my previous videos before where I've talked about pr previously scriptures that prove that our Messiah was in fact hung on a tree as well as the pagan origins of the cross. But I'm going to go over it once again and reiterate it for all of you so that you all can see the truth that has been hidden right in front of you all this time because even your King James version tells you. But I'm here in what? First Peter chapter 2 and we're going to be reading from verses 24. Because as you will see, it even tells you that he was in fact hung on a tree. And it says what? And from First Peter chapter 2, verses 24, Kapha even says that what? Who his own self bear our sins. And of course, the spelling is a little different because it is Old English. Remember, it's from the 1611 version. But it says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. And many of us have heard of that passage and are familiar with, oh, by his stripes we are healed. But did you read the part before where it says in his own body on the tree, who his own self bear our sins in his own body? On the tree, it does not say cross. Very interesting and suspicious indeed. I know you probably have a ton of questions right now. You're probably wondering so much right now, but don't worry, we're going to tackle all of that and all of your questions will be answered because the truth will be revealed to you today so that you are without excuse as to knowing who your true creator, Yahuwah, is and his true son, our true Messiah, Yahusha HaMashiach. Now I'm here in Galatia or Galatians chapter 3, the original KJV, once again, and we're going to be reading what from verses 13 through 14, also common verses. So now we're here in Galatians or Galatim chapter 3, and we're going to be reading from verses 13 and 14. And it says Hamashiach or the word Christ, and we're going to be going over the word Christ and its origins because, yes, that word is pagan too. But it says Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. And no, that, that does not mean that the law is done away with. We're going to be going over that too later on. But it says being made a curse for us, and it's spelled a little different, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on tree or hangeth 
on a tree is what the KJV today says, that the blessing or barakah of Abraham might come on to what they call the Gentiles or Guyim through Yahusha HaMashiach, that we might receive the promise of the Ruach or spirit through belief or through faith. But what does it say? We all have heard this passage and are familiar with it, but it says what? That he's redeemed us from the curse of the law, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And it says he was made a curse for us. How was he made a curse for us? Because he was, because he too was hung on a tree as scripture even says. And that is something we will be going over, but it even says for it is written. Where is it also written in? Because we're here in Deuteronomy or Dabarim chapter 21. And like I said, for all of you, I prove everything with scripture itself. I'm not making this stuff up. I prove everything and justify everything that I'm saying with scripture itself from the King James Version. And we're going to be reading verses 22 to 23 because we're in the Torah now and we're going to see, does the Torah talk about being hung on a tree as punishment? And what you're going to see is that, yes, it does. The Torah itself, scripture itself, does talk about the punishment of being hung on a tree. And it says in verses 22 to 23, And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, then what? And thou hang him on a tree. His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of Allahim. So he's cursed of the father when he's hung on a tree just as what galatians or galatine chapter 3 verses 13 through 14 talks about the precept to this that thy land be not defiled which shahua thy allahim giveth thee for an inheritance. So it even tells us in the Old Testament, in scripture itself, in the Torah itself, that what being hung on a tree is in fact a punishment. But nowhere in the Torah or even the Old Testament itself will you see the punishment of being nailed to the cross. You do not see that anywhere in scripture whatsoever. Somebody is lying to you. By the way, when you know who the real biblical Israelites are, who are the only group of people in history that that you know have been hung on trees. I will let you answer that on your own. I will give you a hint, it has to do with lynching. But I'm here at Staros, and the reason I'm here is because I'm at the Strong's Concordance G4716. And the reason I'm here is because I want to give you a better understanding of the word cross and where the word cross comes from. Because you're probably wondering, well, the KJV says the word cross in some places. You even see the word cross in 27 occurrence in the New Testament. Why do you see that there? Because when you understand the word cross and where it comes from, it comes from the Greek staros, which means an upright stake, which can also be translated correctly as a pole. That is what they is. But what do they like to do? They like to add, oh, hence a cross, or they like to justify by saying a Roman instrument of crucifixion. No, the correct translation is a stake. What did the translators do? They purposefully added the word cross, and they purposefully mistranslated the Greek staros and they purposely added the word cross there to make you think that he was really uh, nailed to the cross when I've just proven with scripture itself that the real Messiah Yahusha Hamashiach is not only so-called black but he was also hung on a tree just like the real biblical Israelites of today and as you can see it was a, a mistranslation is what it is so when it says cross and most notably Mati Yahu or Matthew chapter 16 verses 24 where it talks about taking up the cross and taking up the cross no it should say staros it should say taking up the stake that is what that's talking about because he was placed on a stake to be then hung on the tree and that is exactly what happened but see what did they do they took away the word stake and they added the word cross and they broke commandments they as in the translators they as in the zionists who purposefully did all this stuff they purposefully did that they purposefully broke commandments by adding and taking away from scripture and then fooling you into making you think that the Messiah was in fact nailed to the cross when this is in fact not the case as I have just proven today. Believe a word I'm telling you. Please don't believe a word I'm telling you, but rather do the research on your own and come to your own conclusions because what you're looking at is what? An ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic and what do you see in the middle of it? A cross because you're wondering, well then what are the origins of the cross? 
if the real Messiah was in fact hung on a tree with scripture to prove that. So then where does the cross come from then? The cross was used all the way back in ancient pagan religion. It was used back in ancient Egyptian religion. And we're going to see that too. And it was used as a fortune and symbol of good luck, not just in the Egyptian religion, but also in the Babylonian religion and the Persian religion and the Indian religion. It was a worldwide symbol that was used thousands and thousands and thousands of years before there even was the Messiah, before he even walked the earth, period. And you can even see it in Egyptian hieroglyphics right there. So then, okay, if that's the case, do we see it in other places? Of course we do, because here I'm showing you ancient Egyptian papyruses, and I'm showing you ones that depict what the cross itself and how they were used all the way back then. Instead of crosses, they were used as what? Ankhs, and that's where they come from, the Egyptian Ankh, which was a symbol of good luck and is even used today. You can see what? The, the god Anubis also holds one as well. You can see one right here. You can see another right there there. I've gone over this in my previous video, which I will link below. You see a cross right there. You see a cross right there. You see an ankh right here. They're all over the place. And in fact, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the 11th edition, 1910, volume 7, page 506, quote, various objects dating from periods long anterior to the Christian era have been found marked with crosses of different designs in almost every part of the old world. India, Syria, Persia, and Egypt have all yielded numberless examples, while numerous instances dating from the later Stone Age to Christian times have been found in nearly every part of Europe. The use of the cross as a religious symbol in pre-Christian times and among non-Christian peoples may probably be regarded as almost universal, and in very many cases it was connected with some form of nature worship, unquote. So even according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, and I'm going to leave the link below so you can see it, so you can see that I'm not making this stuff up, that it was used long before and well before Christianity was even invented. This stuff was used well before that. And even Yarm Yahoo or Jeremiah chapter 10 verses 1 through 4, the, our father Yahuwah tells us that we are not to learn the ways of the heathen. So therefore, why would the Messiah be nailed to the cross when the cross was used universally? It doesn't make sense. Because somebody is lying to you. Now here I am showing you another Egyptian papyrus and as you can see it shows you what the Ankh was definitely used. You can find this more in Egyptian carvings, Egyptian inscriptions, and Egyptian hieroglyphics. So you will see that the Ankh what looks just like the cross was in fact used. And according to Alexander Hislops, the two Babylons from the edition of 1959 pages 198 to 199 as well as pages 204 to 205 and I highly recommend you all check check out this book and I'll leave the link below but it says quote that mystic Tao was marked in baptism on the foreheads of those initiated into the mysteries the vestal virgins of papal Rome wore it suspended from their necklaces as the nuns do now there is hardly a pagan tribe where the cross has not been found the X which in itself was not an unnatural symbol of Christ the true Messiah and which had once been regarded as such was allowed to go entirely into disuse and the Tao or the T which is the sign of the cross, was indisputable sign of Tammuz. The false messiah was everywhere substituted in its stead, unquote. And that's exactly where the cross comes from. The cross is the worship of Tammuz, who is what? The sun deity of the son of Nimrod. That is where that comes from and originates from. And we're going to go over more of that later on to come. Oh, but it's not just Christianity that we see the cross. Oh, contrary, because we also see it with what Buddha as well. And as you can see in these Buddha statues, wow, what a very, very interesting and cryptic hand gesture indeed. Where else have I seen another hand gesture that's very similar to that with the two fingers pointing up? Not only that, but you see the halo around him. I've gone over this plenty of times. And also what appears to be right here, the swastika. And if you do more research on the Buddhist swastika, and the swastika in general, you'll see that it's the same thing as the cross. It's no different. It represents the same cross that you see that is associated commonly with Jesus Christ, even though the real Messiah was in fact hung on a tree and had nothing to do with the cross, as I've even proven with scripture itself. But the question is, are you awakened to all of this with both your eyes open?
Now, I know there's so much on your mind, and I know there's so much to digest right now, but don't worry, we're going to get through it together, because I know you're probably wondering, well, what is the history of the church, and where does the church really come from, and are we really supposed to go to church on Sunday, or is that just another form of sun worship, because what does this steeple right here really represent? The phallic symbol of Nimrod, and we'll go over that more when we talk about Christmas, and look what we see here, the cross, the worship of Tammuz, which I've just even proven earlier ago. So now we're going to take a look at a Christian history, and we're going to go in and see how the beast known as the Roman Catholic Church not only changed and twisted commandments and everything and removed commandments and added commandments, but we're going to go through all of the creeds so you can see how everything has been twisted and the dark horrors of Christian history. Because what you will find is that the original word for church, the word church should not be in scripture because in the Hebrew we have kahal, which means assembly. The correct translation is assembly, convocation, and congregation. So if that's the case, then what is the real etymology of the word church? Because that word did not exist back then, just like the word Jesus did not exist back then either, as I have proven. So where are these words coming from then? On over this in my video, what's wrong with Sunday sun worship, but I'm just going to quickly reiterate it here because when you look at the etymology of the word church and you see the actual etymology, it is in fact a noun and it comes from the old English cerisi or what? Circe, which means church, public, place of worship. And it comes from Old Norse Kirja and Old Frisian Zerki and Middle Dutch Kirky, Dutch Kirk, Old High German Kyria and German Kircha. And that is exactly where church comes from. And it also means the Lord's house and it also comes from ruler or Lord, but when you look up the word Lord in the Hebrew, it's talking about Baal. Which Lord are you talking about? Who are you worshiping when you go to church on Sunday? Because when you do more research on Circe, this is what you find from Greek mythology. And as you can see, it says Circe was a goddess of sorcery or pharmakia. And when you look at that up in the Greek, you get what? pharmacy, which is modern day sorcery, by the way, who was skilled in the magic of transmutation, illusion, and necromancy. So it's all about what? Illusion. And she lived on the mythical island of Aea with her nymph companions. So we see that it comes from what? To secure with rings, hoop around, all about magic and illusion and deception. That is what it's all about. And like I said, that is where the church originates from and gets its origin from. Because like I said, the real translation is what assembly that is what it's all about so then why are there churches on almost every block and virtually every block especially if they're run on Sunday and none of them give worship to Yahuwah and his true son Yahusha so then where are these churches really coming from come from the same beast system that made virtually every other change and even created the religion called Christianity because I'm here at the catechism of the Catholic Church and what you're going to see is how they not only change the Sabbath day but they changed it from the seventh day of rest to Sunday and that is exactly what they did under what authority are they doing this over breaking more commandments I see and they and what's worse about all of this is they try to justify by saying that, oh, the Messiah was resurrected on Sunday, and that is why we changed the Sabbath day. But when you actually look at scripture itself, and we're going to talk more about this when we get into Easter and the abomination of desolation, what you're going to see is that the Messiah, the real Messiah, Yahusha, was actually resurrected on the Shabbat. He even says that he is master sovereign, or what you may call Lord of the Sabbath or Shabbat, even in scripture itself. So we're here at some of the catechisms, and as you can see, we're going to go to 2190 specifically, but it talks about the Sabbath day and how they changed it to the Lord's day. Which Lord are they talking about? Because when you look up the word Lord in the Hebrew, you find something very suspicious because it means Baal, and I already talked about how that not only breaks the third commandment, but it breaks all these other commandments, and then it says what? Sunday fulfillment of the Sabbath, breaking the fourth commandment. Okay, then they also added the Eucharist as well, and of course they had the obligation and that's where you get all the mass from and a day of grace and rest from work even though our even though our father Yahuwah has given us his rest day and he says that he does not change according to the book of Malachi in the book of Malachi chapter 3 verses 6 so where's all this Sunday coming in and then it even says right here that what the Sabbath which represented the completion of the first creation has been replaced by Sunday which recalls the new creation inaugurated by the resurrection of Christ and we'll go 
go over more of that in a second. And you're going to see which Christ they're talking about because we're going to go over what the word Christ really means. I'm telling you, it's time to wake up now and see the truth and see the beast and how they have what? Change laws and times. It all started back in 321 AD with Roman Emperor Pope Constantine in AD 321. And it talks about how he converted to Christianity, who was a former sun worshiper, which is where you get Sunday sun worship. Because yes, when you go to church and worship Lord God, who are you worshiping on that day? But it even says, according to the Shaft's History of the Christian Church, Volume 3, Chapter 75, that on the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrate and people residing in cities rest and let all workshops be closed. In the country, however, persons engaged in agricultural work may freely and lawfully continue their pursuits because it often happens that another day is not so suitable for grain growing or for vine planting, lest by neglecting the proper moment for such operations, the bounty of heaven should be lost. But according to our father, we are supposed to rest period on the seventh day and even the sabbatical year. And that includes the field. So like I said, more changing and twisting of laws. Even Catholics themselves and even the Roman Catholic Church admits and openly admits that it changed the Sabbath day from the seventh day of rest to Sunday. Because here I am at the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine and it even says, why do we observe Sunday instead of the Sabbath day or Saturday according to them? And they say we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church and the Council of Laodicea, which we're going to go over from AD 336, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. And, and that is according to Reverend Peter Geiermann from CSSR 1946, page 50. But it doesn't stop there because even the Catholic Christian instructed also talked about it from the Catholic Christian instructed in the sacrament, sacrifices, ceremonies, and observances of the church by way of question and answered by Reverend Dr. Chanelar, page 204. And the abridgment of the Christian doctrine also talks about how they changed the Sabbath to Sunday, how they changed the seventh day to Sunday. And this comes from 1833 from Reverend Henry Tuberville, page 58. And it goes on to talk about this in a, doct a doctrinal catechism from Reverend Stephen Keenan in 1851, page page 174 and also in the Catechism of the Council of Trent as well as where it's also talked about from page 402 in the second revised edition English in 1937 which was first published in 1566 and it also talks about it in the Augsburg Confession as well how they changed the and polluted the Sabbath day from the real Sabbath to Sunday. Oh, but that's not the only evil that the Roman Catholic Church has done because as you will see, they have changed so many laws and so many commandments because they thought to change times and laws and that's exactly what they've done through their catechisms and through their heresies. And if anybody didn't agree with them, then they were to be killed and executed. And we're gonna go over that later on too. But this is one of the catechisms that talks about the 10 commandments. Well, when you look at their 10 commandments, well, there's one that you don't see and the one that you don't see in the Catholic Church is what? No no graven images. Where is the commandment that says no graven images? They took that commandment out and they made the Sabbath day, which is the fourth commandment. They made that the third commandment according to them. Oh, but that's not all because we see here, they say you shall not covet your neighbor's wife and you shall not covet your neighbor's goods, adding and taking away from scripture as we see. Not to mention all of the creeds that have gone on throughout history that the Roman Catholic Church is responsible for and how they removed commandments and added their own commandments, adding and taking away from scripture and then using these creeds to justify what they've done, such as the cross and the Trinity, as well as Sunday sun worship and these churches. Now, I've gone over this in my video, What's Wrong with Sunday Sun Worship? And I talked about the Nicene Creed as well, which is where you get the creation of Christianity. And I talked about this too more into detail and it talks about what how they say on the third day he rose again even though Friday to Sunday according to them that's not even three days that's not three days and three nights and it talks about it and you can come read it on your own to see for yourself with your own two eyes with both your eyes open how the Roman Catholic Church has changed and modified and twisted everything none of it according to scripture itself 
But that's not all that the Roman Catholic Church has done. Oh, we're just getting started because you're seeing Christian history and hidden history that has been hidden from you all this time. Now, this talks about the Laodicean Creed back in the fourth century, which what gave way for the creation of the church. And now we're not going to go over all of these, but we're going to go over some of the canons that were introduced and how they tried to justify Sunday sun worship with the church. So we're going to go over some of these canons. There are a lot of them, and I highly recommend you read them on your own time. I'm going to leave the links below but as you can see in canon 9 it talks about how members of the church were not allowed to meet in cemeteries nor attend the so-called martyries of any of the heretics through their hearsays. canon 10 talks about how the members of the church will not indiscriminately marry their children to heretics those who did not accept uh, catholic hearsays. Uh, canon 11 talks about how certain members were not to be appointed in the church and some of these canons even talk about they even talk about a hierarchy of the church, even though our Messiah himself says that there's not to be a hierarchy in the church whatsoever or anywhere in Matthew or Matthew chapter 6, because it talks about bishops and how they're to be appointed. And then it talks about the election of those to be appointed to the priesthood. What priesthood? Is it the priesthood according to the Levitical priesthood? Of course not. And then it talks about the set apart holy things according to them with Easter and the Feast of Easter, even though this goes against the seven feast days that are mentioned in Leviticus or by Ikra chapter 23, not to mention how it says no other shall sing in the church. And it even says from Canon 16 that the gospels are to be read on the Sabbath or Shabbat with the other scriptures. Then why weren't they going to church or meeting for the congregation on the actual Shabbat? Why were they going on Sunday then? The canons even tell us that they were not supposed to hold feasts in the churches themselves, even though in the scriptures in the Torah, it says that the feasts are to be held in the set apart location which Yahuwah chooses. But what I wanted to show you too was canon 29 that says Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's day. And if they can, resting then as Christians. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema from Christ. And they were to be killed because they were looked at as heretics. Don't you see the bigger agenda? Why do they say that they can't rest on the Sabbath or Shabbat? Changing laws and times. That is exactly what they have done and are doing and have done through this creed and through the Laodicean creed. But we also have the Athanasian Creed, which is the creation of the Holy Trinity. And I've talked about this more in my video, How Holy is the Holy Trinity? And I will talk more about this and elaborate more on this and the concept of the Trinity later on in this video. But of course, they this is where they establish the Trinity, which is unbiblical at all. The word Trinity is not even in scripture whatsoever. We have the Apostles' Creed, which elaborates on the Nicene Creed. Now, I also go over the hidden histories of Roman Catholicism and all of the holy inquisitions that took place because if you did not agree with the Roman Catholic Church then you were to be killed because you were a heretic or you were a witch and these are some of the torturing methods and the torturing devices that were used I go over more of this in my 666 Mark of the Beast video as well as my Mark of the Beast video and you can take a look on your own but what does it represent the harlot church and that's exactly what it's talking about because when you go to church on Sunday to worship Lord God it is mentioning the harlot Charlotte Church spoken of in Revelation 17 that we have covered names and the importance of names as well as the etymology of the letter J, the etymology of Jesus and the true identity of the true Messiah according to scripture itself, as well as the identity theft of the real biblical Israelites, not to mention the death of the true Messiah and the resurrection of the true Messiah and the origins of the cross. Now we're going to go over the etymology of Christ and we're going to see where that word comes from because like I said, this video is the pagan origins of Jesus Christ and we're going to see that the word Christ itself is also pagan and derives from paganisms of both Mithraism and Serapis religions. Now many people try to use this and say and try to justify this and say that oh well it comes from paganisms so the Messiah himself did not exist. No that is not true. The Messiah of the New Testament is real but like I said what is his true name? How does he really look and how did he really die? That that is the questions that we are answering today. So I'm back here at the online etymology dictionary and we're going to go over the word Christ and the word origin of the Christ, which is according to this, a title given to the Messiah, Yahusha, whom is commonly known to the world as Jesus. And we can see that it says Old English Christ by 830, perhaps circa 675 AD 
from the Latin Christus, which is what we're going to be going over from the Greek Christos, which means the anointed, because the Messiah and the word, uh, the Messiah for Hebrew is Mashiach or Hamashiach, which means anointed or anointed one. And you can see more of the Messiah for that one. It's also the noun use of verbal adjective of karine or to rub or anoint or chrism. The Latin term drove out Old English Halen or healer savior as a preferred descriptive term for the Messiah Yahusha, who is commonly known as Jesus. But as you will start to see and as you will start to find out, these same words were the same words that were used to denote pagan deities long before the Messiah was even on the scene. But I'm here and showing you the Greek, where the Greek comes from the word Christ. And you can see Christos to the right, which is from Strong's 5547, which of course means what the anointed or anointed one, which in the Hebrew is Mashiach. And you see that it was used over 569 times in the King James Version translation count. But to the left, you have the word Crestos, which is from Strong's 5543, which you can see right here, which comes from and means in the Greek virtuous or good or fit, kind of like the good sheep. And it was only used seven times in the Greek itself, in the KJV itself. Why is this so important? You're going to see why in just a minute. Because these were the same words to denote pagan deities, and I'm not making this stuff up. But it says the Greeks used both the word Messiah, a so transliteration, and Christos, a translation, for the Hebrew Mashiach, which means anointed, which is talking about Yahusha HaMashiach. The word Christos was far more acceptable to the pagans who were worshiping Creston and Christos, which were pagan Greek deities, by the way. But it goes on to say, according to the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, the word Christos was easily confused with the common Greek proper name Krestos, meaning good, as we went over. According to a French theological dictionary, it is absolutely beyond a doubt that Christus and Krestus and Christiani and Christiani were used indifferently by the profane and Christian authors of the first two centuries AD. The word Christianos is a Latinism being contributed neither by the Jews nor by the Christians themselves. The word was introduced from one of three origins, either the Roman police, the the Roman populace or an unspecified pagan origin. Its infrequent use in the New Testament suggests a pagan origin and that is what I'm trying to get you to see. But this is important because according to Real Encyclopedia, the inscription Crestos is to be seen on a Mithras relief in the Vatican. Mithras relief in the Vatican, huh? Isn't the Vatican from the beast, which is known as what? Papal Rome, the deadly wound that was healed. And we've talked about this in my image and Mark of the Beast videos. Interesting. According to Christianity and mythology, the book Osiris, the sun deity of Egypt, was reverenced as Crestos or good. And the synagogue, oh, where have we seen that? Revelation chapter 2, verses 9, and Revelation chapter chapter 3 verses 9 but in the synagogue of the Marcionites on Mount Hermon built in the 3rd century AD the Messiah's title is spelled Crestos according to Tertullian and Lactantius the common people commonly called Christ Crestos or good but what are the real origins of this as you can see that word Christus and that word Crestus they trace their origin all the way back to Mithraism which came long before Christianity was even on the scene which came long before the real Messiah, Yahusha, was even on the scene. And this is according to Encyclopedia Britannica that talks about Mithraism, which was the pagan religion and the worship of Mithra, the Iranian god of the sun, or sun god, justice, contract, and war, and pre-Zoroastrian Iran. And it's interesting, when you look at pictures of Jesus Christ, and when you look at the halo behind him, and the sun halo behind them, what do you think that's denoting? And by the way, it's abominable because it breaks the second commandment and we even proven that the real messiah looks nothing like that it's the image of the beast wake up but goes on to say known as mithras in the roman empire during the second and third centuries a.d this deity was honored as the patron of loyalty to the emperor after the acceptance of christianity by the emperor constantine in the early fourth century mithraism rapidly declined which got its history and start from zoroastrianism which was from the sixth century bc or earlier so it was the most important of their gods and that's where it came from it started its own religion as well and then it goes on to talk about this more in detail
Now, I would like you to see some of the commonalities that are commonly associated with Mithras and Jesus Christ. Like for one, for example, that what they both have birthdays on December 25th. Do you think that's a coincidence? I don't, especially when nowhere in scripture does it even say that the real Messiah, Yahusha, wants his birth to be celebrated on Christmas, nor does it say he was even born near or around Christmas, but that's for a later discussion later on. But as what you're looking at currently is a description and inscription of an ancient picture of what Mithras the sun deity that is who you're looking at and as you can see behind him what the halo behind him and also what appears to be what thorns and crowns of thorns not to mention but what else do you see this at the statue of liberty Isis is where you also commonly see that and where that's commonly denoted because there's so many similarities and it's time you see the truth and wake up to truth quick fast and in a hurry. Now, another religion that's also associated commonly with the word Christ or Christus is also the religion of Serapis, who is what? The Greco-Egyptian deity. And it talks about this in Encyclopedia Britannica, where it says Serapis, also called Sarapis, was the Greco-Egyptian deity of the sun, first encountered at Memphis, where his cult was celebrated in association with that of the sacred Egyptian bull Apis. And it goes on to talk about he was originally the god of the underworld, but reintroduced as a new deity with many Hellenic aspects by Ptolemy uh, Soter, who reigned between 305 and 284 BCE, or uh, before Common Era, who entered the worship of the deity at Alexandria. So you can see that Serapis was around two to three hundred years before the real Messiah, Yahusha, was on the scene. And you can also see the what? That towards the end of this religion, it signaled the final triumph of Christianity, not only in Egypt, but throughout the Roman Empire. Here I am at Ancient Origins that also talks about Serapis, who was known as the god of fertility and the afterlife that united both the Greeks and the Egyptians. And you're looking at a common picture of Serapis, and who does he also closely resemble? I wonder who that closely matches. Not only that, but he was also commonly known as Serapis Christus. I will repeat that, Serapis Christus. Very interesting and suspicious indeed. But the reason I'm talking about him is because he was worshipped and revered long before Christianity was even a thing. And the whole purpose of this religion is to unite the Greeks and the Egyptians to continue their paganisms. Wow, just like what they did at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD when they merged all these religions together and came up with what you know today as Christianity. Because newsflash, the real Messiah, Yah Yahusha HaMashiach, who you call Jesus, was not even Christian because the word Christian wasn't really around back then and the religion called Christianity did not exist until 325 AD with the what? Council of Nicaea. And I talk more about that in my video from the pagan origins of the Trinity, which we're going to be going over soon enough to come. But why am I talking about this? Is because the real Messiah himself had nothing to do with Christianity. And as I've just proven with scripture, it's earlier ago that the real Messiah was in fact the dark skin was black and had woolly hair according to Hazun Revelation chapter 1 he also had nothing to do with the cross but he was in fact hung on a tree and that's according to Acts chapter 5 verses 30 Acts chapter 10 verses 39 Acts chapter 13 verses 29 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 24 and Galatians chapter 3 verses 13 through 14 which we also went over as well so where's the cross coming from where's that false white image coming from and where's that false name coming from because as we talked about at the very beginning of the video that the real messiah yahusha comes in the name of his father yahua but you receive another one if he comes in his own name very interesting and suspicious indeed i hope you're seeing where all of this is coming from where it's all stemming from because like i said serapis the one who united the greeks and the egyptians the one who was called serapis christus well interesting because the one who's called jesus christ Christ united and merged all some other religions together too and we're going to go over that in just a second so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. This is why I'm telling all of you why language is so important. This is why the Hebrew is so important. This is why language itself is so important and I'm going to keep reiterating that because you all need to seriously do your own research so you can see how important this really is so you can stop sitting there and saying that oh 
oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, we can call them whatever we want to because who are you really calling on when you use these words if you don't know the origin and the etymology of these words? But rather, you don't even have to go do the research on your own because I'm already doing the research for you and putting it right in front of your face because I bet you also did not know that the word Christ in the Sanskrit means Krishna and I'm not making this stuff up because I'm here at a Sanskrit dictionary and as you can see I typed in the word Christ itself so that you can see it and I'm translating it from English to Sanskrit itself so you know I'm not making this stuff up and I'm gonna leave the link below so you can see it but as you can see what is the close match of Christ Krista and if you look at the Greek from Christ you see that in the Sanskrit it matches what Krishna and that is exactly what that's talking about and it even says Krishna one of the names of the great teachers of India classed as an avatar his death in 3102 BC marked the onset of the Kali Yuga or Dark Age Gerald Massey and others equate him with Osiris Horus and Christ did you see that and we talked about Osiris with the religion commonly known as Mithraism and Mithras as well and even Serapis where we talked about Serapis Christus that is where that word originates from but we also see the word Christ in Sanskrit too and the, and of course this is different from the word Mashiach which is the Hebrew which means anointed this is something totally different but you need to understand where all of this is coming from now I'm here at Krishna.com and the reason that I'm here is because I want to share this interview and conversation with you between a Hindu and a Christian and it even says that what Krishna or Christ the name is the same. Now I'm not going to go over all of this but I just want to let you see and let you see the conversation that what when the Hindus call on Krishna and when Christians call on Christ they're calling on the exact same thing. It's just the darn truth and that is what I'm trying to get you to see and this is why language is so important. Do you think it's a surprise or coincidence that both re are reverenced on December 25th with birthdays, both Krishna, the Hindu deity, and Jesus Christ as well. Do you really think that's a coincidence? Do you really think that, oh, that's just some made up thing? I think not. Remember, that is what you must do. Ask questions. And I cannot stress that enough, the importance of asking questions. Because when you ask some serious questions, that is where you get some serious answers. I care more about your salvation than I do your feelings and your opinions right now. Because what am I showing you? I'm showing you what? Jesus and Krishna. Because I've already proven to you with scripture itself that A, the Messiah does not look like this. Because A, he has woolly hair. B, he has dark skin, and C, he was hung on a tree. So this right here does not even match the real Messiah. So the question you should be thinking about is if I've just proven that with Scripture itself, and that even in Scripture that Jesus is not his name with the King James Version itself, where does this come from is the question. And is it a surprise or a coincidence that both Jesus and Krishna were said to be born on December 25th, even though the real Messiah was born nowhere near that their mothers both of their mothers are seen as holy virgins and I'm going to show you that in just a second but they are both also have something to do with a trinity both Krishna and Jesus and not only that but both are said to be the savior even though the real name of the the real Messiah Yahusha even though his name in the Hebrew means that Yah is salvation and that Yahuwah saves so where is all of this coming from is the question because it's no surprise or coincidence that both of them make the same hand gestures, they both have the same sun symbols behind them, and they both have the halos, and everything is the exact same thing. Do you really think that's a coincidence? No, it is not. And trust me, it's not just them two, it's other ones as well, which I'm about to show you. And like I said, ask questions. Why do you think Jesus is always seen with the halo around him? Why do you think Krishna is always seen with the halo around him? Not only that, but why do you think they make the same exact hand gestures and hand movements and body motions? Why do you think that's the case? And why do you always see Jesus Christ holding up that hand gesture and this Masonic hand gesture right here too, which is the same Masonic hand gesture that looks very similar to Cesare Borgia? Why do you think that's the case? And who else holds up that exact same hand gesture? If you have not seen my Image of the Beast video and if you have not seen my Mark of 
of the Beast video, prepare to be blown away because what I'm about to show you in just a second is about to blow your mind away. Before we get into that, I would like to go over with you Christmas and the pagan origins of Christmas because many like to say that, oh, well, we celebrate Christmas because that's the birth of our Messiah, but nowhere is that in scripture, nowhere is that biblical, and the real Messiah was born nowhere near Christmas. Oh, but a bunch of other pagan deities, oh, they are reverenced and celebrated on this pagan holiday. And so what we're going to go over, and I'm going to show you scripture to prove that this is a pagan holiday. And and that that Christmas tree not only represents the phallic symbol of Nimrod, but it also represents the birth of Nimrod, the sun deity. And that's exactly where it comes from. And that's exactly who you're honoring and worshiping when you celebrate Christmas, the memorial of Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. That's exactly what you're doing. But let's, but don't take my word for it. Let's see what scripture says itself about Christmas. Because what you will find is that Christmas was celebrated hundreds of years before the Messiah was even on the scene. And don't believe me? We're here in Yarm Yahu or Jeremiah chapter 10, and we're going to be reading from verses 1 through 4, so you can see for yourself. And it says, Hear ye the word which Yahuwah speaketh unto you, O house of Yashra all or Israel. And we're in the 1611 version. Thus saith Yahuwah, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. Okay. They deck it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers and that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. So it even tells us in scripture tells us that what learn not the way of the heathen because yes the heathen had been celebrating Christmas and honoring Christmas long before there even was the Messiah as you see in the book of Jeremiah itself and later on we're going to be going over Easter as well and how even Easter is in scripture too with the queen mother of heaven in the book of Yarm Yahu Jeremiah as well but as you can see it says for the customs of the people are vain so what does our father Yahuwah think about Christmas it's a pagan hella day. It is in vain. We're not supposed to be doing it. It breaks commandments because the real Messiah was not even born on Christmas. But these are all of the pagan deities who all celebrate birthdays and throughout history on December 25th, all of who were worshipped on December 25th. Do you think it's a surprise or a coincidence? I think not because according to scripture, our real Messiah, Yahusha, was born sometime in the autumn to coincide with the fall feast days. But as you can see, many of the pagan deities and mythologies have been said to have been worshipped and celebrated birthdays on December 25th. And as you can see throughout history, we see Hermes in Greece. We also see Buddha in Nepal. We see Krishna in India, who we just went over. We see Dionysus in Greece. And notice how it says Dionysus, Jesus. Do you think that's a surprise? And we're going to go over more of that later on. But of course, we have Zoroaster as well with uh, Persia, and then we have Horus in Egypt, Mithras in Persia, Hercules in Greece, Tammuz in Babylon, and Adonis in Phoenicia. Now, these dates may not be correct, but this is just to give you a better idea of all of the pagan deities who have been worshipped on December 25th. And do you really think that Jesus Christ is an exception, especially when all of these other ones came before there even was the real Messiah, whose name was then changed to Jesus, whose image was then changed from black to white, who then always has a halo around him, just like Zoroaster and Buddha and Krishna and all of the other ones. Don't believe me? You will after this. Like I said, I'm not making this stuff up. You need to honestly wake up to truth. Now, I'm here telling you more about Christmas and why it's even celebrated and how it gives honor and homage to Nimrod, the sun god. But as you can see, it says, late December, the time of the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere, the shortest day and longest night of the year was full of pagan European celebrations. The Roman Empire declared December 25th a hell a day. The beast system known as Papal Rome or the Roman Empire as we see changing times and laws to celebrate
celebrate the birth of their adopted Syrian god Sol Invictus in 274 AD. Some 50 years later, Roman Emperor Constantine, the same emperor who founded Christianity, officially adopted December 25th as a day of celebrating Christ's birth. Before 1000 BC, we have the following gods or demigods that were also born or celebrated on December 25th. Horus, Osiris, and Atis. Before 200 BC, we have Mithra, Hercules, Dionysus, Tammuz, Adonis, and others. And many of these we just went over. And many of them were also born to virgins. Interesting. We're going to go over that later on too. Interestingly, in ancient mythology, many gods are born to women with names derived from Ma, meaning mother. Mirha in Syrian myth, Maya in Greek myth, Maya in Hindu, and Mary in Hebrew. And by the way, the real name of the Messiah's mother in Hebrew Hebrew, the real name of Yahusha's mother is Miriam, not Mary. And we're going to go more over that later on as well. In fact, in his classic work, Alexander Hislop in the Two Babylons also describes the Babylonian pagan origins of Christmas in his book. And he also describes Yule and how that's pagan as well. And by the way, if you would like to learn more about the Christmas tree, just look this up. And trust me, I'm not making this up. But the myth goes that when Nimrod died, that Semiramis tried to scoop all of his body parts except one. And the one that she could not scoop up was what? The phallic symbol, which is is where you get the Christmas tree and the steeple and the obelisk and those tall buildings. That is what that symbolizes, the phallic symbol of Nimrod, literally. It's time to wake up. But it says on page 93, long before the 4th century and long before the Christian era itself, a festival was celebrated among the heathen at that precise time of the year in honor of the birth of the son of the Babylonian queen of heaven. It may fairly be presumed that in order to conciliate the heathen and to swell the number of the nominal adherents of Christianity, the Roman Church, or the B system, giving it only the name of Christ, adopted the same festival. This tendency on the part of Christians to meet paganism halfway was very early developed, and we find Tertullian, even in his day, about the year 230, bitterly lamenting the inconsistencies of the disciples of Christ in his respect and contrasting it with the strict fidelity of the pagans to their own superstition. In fact, the name Yule is the Babylonian word for infant or little child, as Hislop describes on pages 93 and 94 of his book, which says, quote, that Christmas was originally a pagan festival is beyond all doubt. The time of the year and the ceremonies with which it is still celebrated proved its origin. In Egypt, the son of Isis, the Egyptian title for the queen of heaven, was born at this very time at about the time of the winter solstice. The very name by which Christmas is popularly known among us, Yule Day, proves at once its pagan and Babylonian origin. Yule is the Chaldean name for an infant or little child, and as the 25th of December was called by our pagan Anglo-Saxon ancestors, Yule Day, or the Child's Day, and the night that preceded it, Mother Night, long before they came in contact with Christianity that sufficiently proves its real character. Far and wide in the realm of paganism was this birthday observed. So yes, when you offer Yuletide greetings and celebrate Christmas, you're actually acknowledging Nimrod's birthday because the real Messiah, Yahusha, had nothing to do with Christmas or December 25th whatsoever. Because nowhere in scripture will you find the concept of Christmas whatsoever. Nowhere in scripture will you find that the Messiah was even said to be born on December 25th or anywhere in the winter whatsoever. Just like you will not find in scripture or the King James Version itself the word Trinity because the Trinity concept is a lie. And I've talked about this more in my video, uh, How Holy is the Holy Trinity, because the Trinity is also pagan as well. Nowhere in scripture does it even say or talk about the Trinity in and nowhere does it mention the Trinity either. But why am I talking about this? Is because you see the Trinity concept embedded in many other pagan religions. Why do you think this is the case? And for those of you who still think that, oh, Jesus is God and that, oh, Jesus has replaced God, I'm telling you, it's time to get out of that trap of religion and see the truth for what it is. Because the first commandment even tells us that we are not to have any other idols or gods before our father, Yahuwah. And that is 
is the truth, nor are we to have any graven images. That is the second commandment. So when you say that Jesus is the most high, that is pure blasphemy. That is breaking commandments. Oh, but what did the Roman Catholic Church do? In their Catholic Bibles, they even took out the second commandment, which is the commandment of no graven images and replaced it with another one. And I've gone over that in many of my other videos. You can even do the research on that to see that they've actually done this, not to mention taking out laws, replacing laws, adding and taking away from scripture, and then feeding you this lie of the Trinity, because where does the Trinity come from? As you see the Trinity concept heavily embedded in pagan religions and in ancient religions, and you even see it in ancient Egyptian religion, and you even see what? Isis, Osiris, and Horus. And notice what they have, the sun symbol above the head. Do you really think that this is a coincidence? I'm telling you, you see it all over the place, embedded all over the place. And like I said, you see the sun symbol around. Nothing new is under the sun, not to mention the serpent above its head. What do you think it's really trying to show you and symbolize? And why do you think in all of these ancient religions, they all have some sun symbolism or some symbol of the sun embedded in their religion? Why do you see that with pictures, abominable pictures, by the way, of Jesus Christ when the real Messiah doesn't even look like that? Do you really think that this is a coincidence? I think not, because here I am showing you the Hindu trinity, and as you can see, this is the Hindu trinity from left to right. We have Brahma, who is said to be the creator, and we have Vishnu, who's said to be the preserver, as well as Shiva, the destroyer, and you see Shiva with CERN. Yes, you should be concerned, and it's no surprise for Shiva that you see a what? All the serpents around his head, not to mention the beads and everything, just like you see with prayer and rosary beads, and both Buddhism and Catholicism is is that a surprise or a coincidence either? Not to mention how all of them have a sun halo symbol all around them, just like the images of the false white image of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, in the false name, by the way. Why do you think they all have the sun symbolism around them and they're all holding up these different hand gestures? And by the way, Shiva's holding up a trident. Well, it's just very interesting and suspicious indeed because if you were to flip the two ends of the spears of this trident and if you were to flip them to be horizontal this way, it looked like he was holding a cross just like the Buddha swastika that is exactly shaped like a cross. Oh my goodness, very interesting. Is that a coincidence either? And then, of course, we also have the Greek Trinity as well. We have Athena, Apollo, and none other than Zeus himself. That is exactly where you find that too. Oh, but that's not the only place you find trinities. Don't worry. It's not just the Greek, Egyptian, or Hindu culture that you see trinities. It's also in other cultures too that were worshipped by Vikings just as well. Because above you see a picture of Jesus, Tertatus, and Tyrannus right here. And notice what? It looks to be another halo sun symbol around and wow, they hold up the same exact hand gesture as Jesus Christ do, and another figure as well. Is that a coincidence? I'm not making this stuff up. You all need to seriously see what's right in front of you. And there's the Norwegian Trinity as well in the 14th century too. And of course we have what? Horus and the Egyptian Trinity. And is it a surprise or a coincidence that the IHS symbolism can also spell out Isis, Horus, and Seb? I do not think so. That is exactly what it's talking about. And of course we have Krishna too that is also represented too with Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva in these trinities respectively in the Hindu incarnations as well. But is that all? No, because it seems as though every single culture and every single region has had trinities or had some type of trinities even long before there was the Messiah on earth. Because here we have the Egyptian trinity of Osiris, Isis, and Horus, of course. And here's the Babylonian trinity of who? Semiramis, Tammuz, and Nimrod himself. And then we have Palmyra as well, a triune there. We also have it with India, as we talked about, with Brahma, Shiva, and uh, Vishnu too. And then we also have it in other places, in Buddhist places. We also see it in Norway as well. We also see it in France too. We also see trinities embedded in Germany with the Vikings in Italy as well. I'm telling you, it's all over the place. It's worldwide. And these trinities came long before and long after the Messiah. And like I said, nowhere in scripture does it even say the word Trinity. So we know it is of pagan descent and of pagan origin.
Now, I've already gone over this in my How Holy is the Holy Trinity video, which I will link below so that you can see the idea of the Trinity is entirely pagan because there are many other regions worldwide before and after the Messiah that all had concepts of Trinity. And so to review, we also see the Trinity in Sumerian culture with Enlil, E and Anu, as well as Babylon with Semiramis, Tammuz, and Nimrod. We also see it, of course, in the Indian culture with Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. And not to mention the Greek culture, we see it twice with Athena, Apollo, and Zeus. Not to mention from the writings and the works of Aristotle, we also see the beginning, middle, and end being its own trinity. And according to Egyptian mythology, of course, we have Horus, Isis, and Osiris. In the Phoenician culture, we have Ulomis, Ulosurus, and Elion. And in the Roman culture, we have Jupiter, Neptune, and Pluto. In the German mythology, we have Wodan, Thor, and Frico. And in the Celtic region, we have Creosan, Bioska, and Siva, who just so happens to sound like Shiva because they borrowed it from the Hindu culture as well. And then for the Christian religion, we have the Athanasian Creed, which is where you get the Trinity from in the Christian religion religion because it was formed at the Athanasian Creed in the 4th century AD and I've covered this more in my video and that's where you get the idea of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as being three separate persons in one even though this is not biblical there's no scripture to back that up whatsoever and it goes against the commandments and the righteous commandments of our father Yahuwah. I hope you're seeing this. If you would like to learn more information about that I will leave the helpful links below so that you can see it on your own but now that we know the trinity is in fact pagan as well just like christmas and everything else well what about the whole mother child and worshiping mother child where does that come from i'll tell you where it comes from it goes all the way back and traces all the way back to babylonian religion that is where all of that comes from that is where it all started with nimrod and semiramis and tammuz it's the exact same thing and such a concept spread from nation to nation, from culture to culture, and that is why you see the Trinity everywhere. But that's not the only thing that spread from culture to culture and nation to nation, because what also spread is what? The idea of mother and child, and the idea of worshiping mother and child, and the idea of Mary and Jesus. Well, is Mary and Jesus anything new? Because I'm showing you statues of the Black Madonna, and rem remember, it all stems from an original from the Roman Catholic Church, the same beast system in the church that took out the second commandment in order to justify such abominable pagan worshiping and statues and graven images when it goes against the commandments of our father Yahuwah. And he does not appreciate that. But do you see this in just the Christian culture? Or was it already embedded in these cultures and religions in different places thousands of years before there even was Christianity? Here I'm showing you a picture of a statue of the Black Madonna, as you can see the mother with child that is actually seen in a museum. Now the reason I'm showing you this is because this is a statue that is seen primarily in Europe and other different places. But if you look closely towards the bottom, you also see pine cones. And if you watch my video, The Truth About the Third Eye, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about and exactly what those pine cones are referencing. More abominations indeed. Because what you will find is that we see the same mother and child all over the place and we see that it was embedded in other cultures and other religions and other nations thousands and thousands of years ago and what you're looking at right now is a picture of who Semiramis and Tammuz that is exactly what you're looking at their statue and when you look at Semiramis wow she kind of reminds you and is very reminiscent of the Statue of Liberty holding what appears to be a torch interesting and look at the hand gesture that Tammuz is making. Wow, doesn't Jesus Christ make that exact same hand gesture or am I just seeing things? Oh no, it's definitely a coincidence because I'm showing you who another Egyptian mother and child statue of who? Isis and Horus. And that is where you get that from, who looks very similar and very reminiscent of who? Mary and Jesus. Now yes, the real Messiah, Yahusha, he did in fact have a mother, but nowhere did they tell us to go and make statues of them and go paint them white and go make abominable images of them to in order to worship them. Nowhere does he tell us to do 
that in scripture. Nowhere does the Messiah teach on that, but rather he teaches the law, statutes, and commandments, which we're going to be going over later on. And as you can see, there's a halo around them too. I wonder why that's always the case. But we don't just see the mother and child reference embedded in Egyptian and in Babylonian cultures. Oh no, because we also see it in the Indian culture as well with Devaki and Krishna too. And this is one image showing it and depicting it. And it looks like Krishna has what? A sun halo around him in this picture. But we also see it here with who? Devaki and Krishna. I'm not making this stuff up. It's time that you see what's right in front of you. And it, it's very reminiscent of who? Mary and Jesus, the Queen Mother of Heaven. That is where that comes from. That is where that originates from. Scripture even talks about the Queen Mother of Heaven and how abominable it is in the book of Yarm Yahu or Jeremiah, which we're going to be going to in a second. But these aren't the only places that you see it. We also see it embedded in the Buddhist culture as well, because this is a picture depicting who? Buddha and his mother Maya. And that's exactly what you see. And look what's around young Buddha here, a sun symbol as well, no different, nothing new is under the sun, not to mention the M-A that we're always seeing that are often associated with the names of these mothers. For example, we see Maya and Buddha, Mary and Jesus. And when you look at the word mother in the Hindi, you get the word man for Krishna. Very interesting and suspicious indeed, but I bet you still think it's all a coincidence. I'm sorry to tell you this, but it is not, because I'm here showing you a Chinese depiction of Hu Xing Mu, the queen mother in China. And this is a representation of the mother and child that is also seen and embedded in Chinese culture and ancient Chinese cultures as well. As you can see, Xing Mu, who is often known as the queen mother in China. And notice the sun symbols around them too, as well, around the mother and child. Oh, but it's all a coincidence. This is a statue depicting the Queen Mother in China. As you can see, this statue depicts Xing Mu right here, and there's the child right there. Very interesting and suspicious indeed. And this is mostly seen in China as well. So we also see it in Chinese culture, Buddhist culture, Asian culture, Hindu culture, as well as Egyptian culture and Babylonian culture. Nothing new is under the sun indeed. But Alexander Hislop also talks about it in the two Babylons, and I'm here at chapter 2, section 2, which talks about the worship of the mother and child and the origins of this. Now it says, while this is the theory, the first persons in the Godhead was practically overlooked. As the great invisible taking no immediate concern in human affairs, he was to be worshipped through silence alone. That is, in point of fact, he was not worshipped by the multitude at all. The same thing is strikingly illustrated in India at this day, though Brahma, according to the sacred books, is the first person of the Hindu triad, and this is talking about the Trinity by the way, and the religion of Hindustan is called by his name, yet he is never worshipped and there is scarcely a single temple in all India now in existence of those that were formerly erected to his honor. So also it is in those countries of Europe where the papal system or the beast is most common completely developed. In papal Italy, as travelers universally admit, except where the gospel has recently entered, all appearance of worshipping the king eternal and invisible is almost extinct, while the mother and the child are the grand objects of worship. And that's something, like I said, that we want to talk about because it goes against commandments and it breaks commandments rather than worship the father himself and the father and the father alone. According to his name, Yahuwah, they gone about and worship pagan idols and have partaken in idolatry, all of them. But it goes on to say, exactly so. In this latter respect, also was it in ancient Babylon. The Babylonians, in their popular religion, supremely worshipped the goddess mother and a son, who was represented in pictures and in images as an infant or child in his mother's arms. And we're going to go to that figure in a second. From Babylon, this worship of the mother and the child spread to all the ends of the earth, because where did it get its origins from? From Sim 
Semiramis and Tammuz and Nimrod, the same trinity where that all spread to. And here's the figure that I wanted to show you, which also shows you how it was uh, embedded in pagan religion from Babylon and from India as well, figure five and figure six. And this comes from, from Quito's Illustrated Commentary, volume four, page 31, as well as Indrani, the wife of the Indian god Indra from Asiatic Researches, volume six, page 393. But when we go back to it, it goes on to talk about how in Babylon, of course, the worship spread to all ends of the earth. In Egypt, the mother and the child were worshipped under the names of Isis and Osiris. In India, even to this day, as Isi and Iswara. In Asia, as Sibel and Deus. In pagan Rome, as Fortuna and Jupiter Puor, or Jupiter the boy. In Greece, as Ceres, the great mother with the babe at her breast, or as Irene, the goddess of peace with the boy Platus in his arms. And even in Tibet and China and Japan, the Jesuit missionaries were astonished to find the counterpart of Madonna and her child as devoutly worshipped as in papal Rome itself, Xing Mu, the Holy Mother in China, which we just went over, being represented with the child in her arms and a glory around her, exactly as if a Roman Catholic artist had been employed to set her up. Did you hear that Roman Catholic Church, the same beast system that has gone and created all of these religions so that they can be worshipped except our Father? And yes, that includes Islam as well. What do you think it's all for? It's the beast system all over again. Because it's no surprise that you see the mother-child worship in all these cultures embedded throughout all of these cultures, not to mention Mary and Jesus themselves. But we also see it with Maya and Hermes, Semel and Dionysus, and we also see it with Dugdova and Zoroaster. And we see it all across Rome, India, Egypt, China, Persia, Greece, Asia, etc. And also we even see names applied to the pagan goddesses of Semiramis. And we see their Greek and the Roman equivalent. So we see in the Greek equivalent, we have all these goddesses of fertility, love, hunting, birth, and whatever else. But it says Aphrodite, Artemis, Athena, Demeter, Gaia, Hera, Hestia, and Rhea. And in Roman culture, we see Venus, Diana, Minerva, Ceres, Terra, Juno, Vesta, and Ops. And it, it's all the same thing. It it all comes from Semiramis. It all comes from and stems from Babylonian religion. And my hope is that you see how all of these religions, how all of them stem from Babylonian religion, ancient Babylonian religion. And yes, that includes Christianity. My hope is that you're seeing how all of it embeds from the beast system known as the Roman Catholic Church. Because later on, I'm going to show you how the Roman Catholic Church is looking to unite all of these religions together to get ready for the one world religion. Why do you think that is? And like I said, if they're all depicted with the sun halo symbol behind them, literally, why is that always the case? But we don't just see that for Semiramis either. We also see it embedded with Nimrod as well. And this is why language is so important because there are many lords and there are many gods. Which one are you calling on? Because the creator of heaven and earth has given us his name, but it has been taken out of scripture courtesy the Roman Catholic Church, courtesy the beast, and replaced with pagan titles to none effect. But now the truth is being restored for you today. There is no excuse. And and as you can see, these are some of the other names for Nimrod. I'm not going to go over all of them, but as you can see, it's some of that we've already talked about, such as Tammuz and such as Osiris, such as Odin, Poseidon, Zeus. Many of these you've probably heard before. We also see Ares and Bacchus. We also see Diani, Zeus. Huh, where else have I heard the Zeus before? Okay, we have Mars and Cupid and Mercury and Pluto, Neptune, Jupiter, Saturn. See, so we see it all over the place. And not to mention even Baal, Bel, or Bellus, which means Lord. So when you call on the Lord, you're actually calling on Baal. And also El Bar, which means God the Son, Molech, of course, Atlas, Saint Valentine. We also even have Dagon, the fish god. And by the way, that hat that the Pope wears and that hat that you see the Pope wears, go look it up and how it is exactly the same thing as what? Dagon, the fish god. It's no different. I'm telling you, it's time to wake up and see what's been right in front of you.
you. The goal is to ask questions and that is what I'm trying to get you to do is ask questions and think about these things that you may have never thought about ever before because when you start asking questions that is when you get some serious answers. Now I'm about to show you a brief montage of pagan abominable images that all have sun worship and sun symbolism in them and of course I'm doing this for educational purposes. Now the reason I'm showing you this is because I want you yourself to see all of the similarities that are embedded in all of this from every single culture, every single religion. Please see all of the similarities. Now the very first one you're looking at is an ancient Egyptian papyrus that is showing you who? Ra the sun deity. That is what that's showing you and as you can see Ra is depicted here and what? The sun symbolism around him and what? The serpent right above and what is he holding? What? He's holding what looks to be a staff right there and he's not the only one and we also see what an Ankh right there or what looks to be a cross and we see Ankhs all over the place but is that all? Here you see an ancient depiction of an ancient Egyptian papyrus depicting who? Horus the sun deity, the falcon deity whom he was worshipped and revered as in ancient Egypt. And you see the ancient Ankhs right there, right there once again. What does that remind you of? Not to mention, but it looks as though what the sun symbol above it. And you can see it looks like what the phoenix rising out of the ashes. Where else have I seen something very similar to this on? the dollar bill on the back of the quarter wow is that is is that a coincidence Remember, ask questions. Why all the similarities? Because as you can see right here, what am I showing you? The Hindu trinity, well, why do they have the sun halo depicted behind them? Why all of these serpents all over the place? Why the trident that he's holding up, just like the staff we saw with Ra, not to mention all of these hand gestures and hand symbols that we see all over the place and embedded in every single religion, not just Hinduism, but Jainism as well. Why is that always there? the case. Because when you look at them up closer, then you start to see and notice some very suspicious things. Because here we're looking at Shiva once again, the Hindu deity of destruction. And we see the trident right there, the halo symbolism behind him, the serpents all over the place, just as we saw in embedded in ancient Egyptian religion, not to mention the hand gesture right there. We're going to go over more of that in just a second. But why are we always seeing this more serpents down there? Why is this always the case? But we even see it with Brahma as well. As you can see, here's a picture of Brahma and what's behind him of what appears to be another halo and more hand gestures right there, more hand gestures right there. Why all of these different hand gestures subliminally speaking? Why do you see it all over the place? Why is it embedded all over the place? Have you ever asked yourself these questions? Because now is the time to ask these serious questions. Because as you can see, here's a picture of Krishna depicting Lord Krishna. And you can see more hand gestures right there. And the sun symbolism that is always depicted behind him. And many of these idols have to do with or are associated with December 25th as well. And we're going to go over that later on. But is he the only one? No, because we also have Buddha as well. And in many depictions of Buddha and in many statues of Buddha, you can see Buddha holding up different hand gestures. Wow, where else have I seen these type of hand gestures held up before? We're going to go over that later on. But we see more hand gestures that are held up just like we saw with Shiva as well and Krishna too. And we see the halo depicted behind him. And even in certain statues of Krishna, we also see what the swastika cross as as well, just like the Egyptian cross from the Ankh, just like the Christian cross. Is it really any different? No, it is all the same thing, and that is what I'm trying to show you. It is the exact same thing, because here is another deity that was reverenced and worshipped on December 25th, as we've just gone over Mithras earlier ago. And as you can see Mithras, you see the sun halo behind him, and you see the hand gesture with all the fingers held up right there as well. And you see what appears to be looking like and very reminiscent of the sun halo symbols, not to mention the Statue of Liberty Isis as well. Well, is that a surprise or a coincidence? I don't think so.
But we even see some of the same depictions depicted with Zoroaster, the sun god, as well. Because as you can see, you see the sun halo behind him always depicted. And he's always holding one finger up with a hand gesture right here. And he's often depicted holding a staff. Are you seeing the similarities? I hope so, because he's not the only one who's also associated with December 25th either. Because we also see it with Heracles as well. We also see Heracles holding up a staff too. Wow, the staff with serpents on it? Where else have I seen that? Oh yeah, I've seen it with Hermes too, because we also see the sun symbolism depicted here, and Hermes is also holding up a staff with the serpents around him. Where else have I seen all of this? I'll let you figure it out before I tell you. Because if you have not seen my Mark of the Beast or Image of the Beast video, well then your mind is about to be blown because this is showing you a picture of Dionysus and you see what appears to be more sun symbolism around him. And even the finger gestures right there, the two fingers up and the two fingers pointed downward. Huh, is that a surprise or coincidence? Who else makes that hand gesture? But we even see the same things depicted with Serapis as well, who we've gone over a couple of minutes ago and we see him holding a trident as well just like Sheba too is that a surprise or a coincidence I do not think so but we also see the exact same thing with Adonis as well and here's a depiction of Adonis who's holding a trident right there we see the sun symbolism around him to represent the sun worship not to mention the sun worship right there on his phallic symbolism which is automatically reminds us of Nimrod. Oh, but he's not the only one because who else do we always see with the sun halo depicted around him holding up some type of hand gesture, not to mention also associated with December 25th, along with Hermes, Heracles, Adonis, Krishna, Buddha, Dionysus, Mithras, Horus, Nimrod, and Osiris. Who else do we see these common hand gestures holding? We also see the exact same symbolisms and abominable images of Jesus Christ, the false white image. And as you can see, once again, why are all of these images, why do they all depict him with the halo symbol around him and this hand gesture here? Have you ever wondered where that comes from? I'm about to show you something that's going to be mind-blowing in just a second. But as you see right here, he's holding up what this right there. That's another Masonic hand gesture right there. Have you ever wondered why they're always seen holding this stuff up have you ever asked yourself these questions remember ask questions and you'll get answers because even ancient Russian icons also depict him holding the exact same hand gesture the same hand gesture with the two fingers up and the two fingers pointed down not to mention this Masonic hand gesture right there not to mention here what the Sun halo symbol behind him and the cross symbol behind him too which we just went over not to mention this symbol right here if you've seen my mark of the beast video I go into detail what that symbol really means and what it really represents. But you even see it in ancient Russian icons depicting the black messiah as well because you see once again the halo right there behind him and the cross symbol right there and in this image you can hardly see it but the two fingers pointed upward and downward this symbol right there and this Masonic hand gesture that is pointed right there too. Why are we always seeing the exact same things in some of the exact same images and the sun halo symbol in all of these pagan abominations abominable images just as we've seen in other pagan abominable ones of pagan idols such as Krishna and Dionysus and Buddha and all the others that I've just shown you. Why are we always seeing the same similarities? Because we even see some of the same depictions and depicted in images of Mary too, the false white image of Mary because newsflash, the real Messiah Yahusha, his real mother Miriam looked nothing like that, nor was she depicted like that. But as you can see, we see the sun halo symbol around the pagan abominable images of Mary and we too see her holding up this same Masonic hand gesture and this is a very satanic symbol too with the two fingers pointed upward and the two fingers pointed downward too. We see it with with Mary the Queen Mother of Heaven as well and we also see it of course like I said with Jesus too with the Sun symbol right there and the cross right there and the heart right there which is all satanic it all stems from ancient pagan Babylonian religion mystery Babylonian religion not to mention that hand gesture which is very Masonic and the two fingers pointed upward and the two fingers pointed downward who else holds up that exact same hand gesture what you are about to see is about to blow 
your mind away if you have not already seen it. Because like I said, ask questions. Who else holds this exact same hand gesture? Who else holds the exact same hand gesture? Because we also see the Baphomet statue and the Baphomet holds up the exact same hand gesture, no different with the two fingers pointed upward and the two fingers pointed downward, just as we see with these pagan abominable images of Jesus Christ. And if you don't believe me, please pause the video and go back so that you can see I'm not making this stuff up. It is the darn truth, not to mention the serpent symbol right there as well. Why do you think that's the case? We even saw that with others as well. We even saw it with Hermes and all the other ones too and Shiva as well with the serpents and Ra as well. Why do you think that's the case? Do you really think that's a coincidence? Hello, it's Satan literally telling you where that image comes from and what that image literally symbolizes. This is no coincidence whatsoever. No, it's no coincidence at all because here is another statue depicting the Baphomet as you can see what looks to be the halo symbolism around and the pentagram as well, more religious symbolisms. Not to mention again the two fingers pointed upward and downward. You see the exact same thing and the serpents right here as well and two children looking up because that is whom Satan targets the most. Do you think this is a coincidence? No, it is not a coincidence. Why does Jesus hold up this exact same hand gesture because it's the image of the beast literally not to mention Zoroaster, Krishna, Buddha and all the ones I've just shown you. Religion has been exposed to you today. The truth is being revealed to you today so that you can see it with your own two eyes with both your eyes open because the truth has been revealed to you today. I've already gone over this in both my Mark of the Beast and my Image of the Beast videos but I will reiterate it once again so that you can see the truth and be deceived no more because this is from the Catholic News Agency that talks about in first prayer video Pope stresses interfaith unity we are all children of G.O.D. quote and this is so important because when you start to see what the B system known as the Roman Catholic Church is doing and how they're merging all of these religions together how they want to merge Christianity Islam and all these religions together with Hinduism Buddhism and all the other ones I'm telling you then you see the bigger agenda why do you think the Pope is stressing this? Why do you think the Pope is urging all of these religions to come together? What are they getting ready for? And this is a headline from CNN and as you can see it says why all faiths can unite to end modern slavery and like I said ask questions why do you think the Vatican and the Pope are so vehemently pushing and preparing for pushing religions and uniting religions together and how you can unite them all together in peace and unity why do you think they're doing that just why are they doing this what are they getting ready for what's the bigger agenda behind all this and why is the beast system which is the Roman Catholic church trying to unite all these religions together. Now, I've also talked about this too, and I'll briefly go over it once again. But as you can see, this is a picture that was taken from the Pope's visit to America when he conducted the multi-religious service back in September of 2015 upon his visit to New York City. Now, the reason this is so important and the reason this got so much attention is because the Pope made some very blasphemous statements there. Well, he makes blasphemous statements every single day, but especially here when he was basically talking about how all of these religions can come together and when he says that, oh, we're all trying to find G-O-D in our own way, and it's okay if we can find him this way, it's okay if we can seek him that way, it's okay if we can seek him this way, it's okay if we can seek him using Sikhism to seek him. When our father, Yahuwah, the one who created heaven and earth, tells us how we are to seek him through his scriptures itself. But yet the Pope is saying something completely different in trying to merge all of these religions together and trying to merge all of these different religions together, and that is what they did at the multi-religious service because remember they say that oh you can seek him and you can find G-O-D you can find God this way you can find God that way well which God is he talking about because second Corinthians chapter 4 verses 4 will even tell you that but I'm here at the multi-religious service at the 9-11 memorial and museum at the World Trade Center which was conducted back on September 25th 2015 when the Pope made his visit to America the very first one very cryptic 
authentic and interesting and suspicious indeed. But I just want to go over some of what he talks about and what he says and how they took a moment of silence. But the, what he also says is something very interesting too, because he even says towards the end of it that what? This can only happen if we uproot from our hearts uh, the all feelings of hatred, vengeance, and resentment. We know that that is only possible as a gift from heaven. Here in this place of remembrance, I would ask everyone together, each in his or her own way, to spend a moment in silence and prayer. Let us implore from on high the gift of commitment to the cause of peace. Peace in our homes, our families, our schools, and our communities. Peace in all those places where war never seems to end. Peace for those faces which have known nothing but pain. Peace throughout this world which G.O.D. has given us as the home of all and a home for all. Simply peace. Let us pray in silence. And then, of course, they took a moment of silence. Huh? What does this remind me of? And what does this remind you of? Oh, yeah. First Thessalonians 5, 3, when they say peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction as travail upon a woman. Don't you see what's going on? He's pushing the false peace and he's pushing that, oh, all these religions can unite together in peace in order to get ready for the one world religion, the new world religion, which is going to be part of the new world order. But that's not the only place that we're seeing the Pope trying to unite and merge all these religions together as a one world religion because we also see he's trying to do this with the event Together 2016 in Washington, D.C., which is going to be held on July 16th. Very interesting. And it goes on to even say that it was announced that Pope Francis would deliver a video message to help unite Christians in all religions and what they call the next great awakening at Together 2016, which, which is what? Bringing together different religions in an effort to erase the lines of doctrinal divisions. Don't you see what he's trying to do? Merge all these religions together. And that's exactly what this movement is about. That's exactly what they're trying to do. Push to merge all these religions together for the one world religion. And I'm actually at the website at Reset 2016, also known as Together 2016, because that is exactly what they are trying to do. Unite it all together. Because what are they really getting us ready for? Because the Roman Catholic Church and the Vatican are getting ready for Project Bluebeam. And if you have not watched my Project Bluebeam video, please do. It's vital that you see exactly what they're getting ready for and why they are merging these religions together because what's about to happen and what's the bigger agenda because when chaos starts to happen and when stuff starts to hit the fan, your lovely president and the Vatican and your lovely Pope are going to go onto the scene and soon they're going to tell you that, oh my goodness, we've made contact with aliens. Oh my gosh, here are aliens and they're coming and we have to fight them off and merge together as a new world order to fight off and combat this threat because they're coming from some alleged planet that doesn't exist because they've already been here. They, as in the aliens, who are really the demons and the fallen angels in disguise, but what are they going to do? They're going to try to stage this alien deception, and they're going to try to stage this alien uh, invasion hoax, and when they do that, the only way they can merge as a new world order and a one world government is the one world religion because they're going to fake and stage a millennial, and they're going to turn the sky into a screen coming Coming to a sky near you and what you're gonna see is you're gonna see some holographic image of Jesus Christ in Western uh, countries you're gonna see some holographic projection of Buddha in Asian countries and uh, Krishna in Indian countries and Muhammad in Islamic countries and that you're gonna see this in the screen and will you think it's real will you think it's the real millennial or will you wake up now and see the deception that is even at the door what hand gesture is he holding up I'm telling you it's it's time you see these deceptions and do not be fooled and be not deceived, be deceived no more because it's only a matter of time. It is even at the door. Like I said, they're looking to stage their millennial and the question is, are you ready for it? Will you be deceived no more or will you continue to buy into the lies? And you're probably wondering, what is the truth out of all of this? Now that we have seen and exposed all of the lies and the paganisms that are associated with Jesus Christ, you're probably wondering what is the truth well we know the real name of our real messiah yahusha but we have to get into some more truths as well and now we're going to be getting into the names jesus and yeshua and what they really mean in the greek and latin we're also going to be talking about the abomination of desolation the strong delusion what scripture actually says and what our real messiah yahusha teaches and instructs us to do so that you will be deceived no more so that 
that the truth will be revealed to you today, nothing but the truth, so that you will have both your eyes open to this truth. We are first going to go over what Jesus means in the Greek, and then we're going to go over what Jesus means in the Latin. Now, as you can see, what is the real name of the Messiah? We know it's Yahusha, and the real name of our father is Yahuwah. So then where does Jesus comes from? Where the Isus, which is the Greek version, which we talked about earlier, it actually means Hail Zeus. And notice how it says Isus, Jesus, it sounds just like Zeus. I'm not making this stuff up, but it goes on to say according to the dictionary of christian lore and legend but it also says the name of jesus is a 400 year old name approximately because the english language never had the letter j till then and i've proven that with the king james version 1611 itself because you saw no letter j in there whatsoever this is very important because it says in the bible or scriptures by one name only shall you be saved in off or acts chapter 4 verses 12 which we're going to go over with later so becomes frightfully important because it is a recent name not known by the almighty Yahuwah. In fact, the original KJV had the name Isus inside, which we already went over, and you've even seen it for yourself with your own very two eyes. This is also a historical record of the fact that the name Jesus is a very modern name in terms of history. So then where is the Isus coming from in the Greek? Because remember, Isus is a Greek name, and it has the what? Seus in it which means Zeus or Hail Zeus. So yes, when you say Jesus, you're actually saying Hail Zeus and you don't even know it. But that's not all because it says on the flip side of the subject, we have the Greek god Zeus, who is a representation of the sun god, who is the devil as known by ancient cultures, which we talked about the sun god. Here's below some information on the subject, but take into the account no name beginning with the letter J can be attributed to the Almighty. The, um, we already talked about that in the name Jehovah cannot be the name of the Almighty either because Jehovah has the letter J too. But we have a clue with hallelujah and we talked about this because hallelujah means praise Yah. So Yah is his name and we even saw that in Psalms chapter 68 verses 4, the name of our father Yah Yahuwah and the name of his son Yahusha because we even talked about that in Yahukanan or John chapter 5 verses 43. Now here are some more references that you can look at, and this comes from Sabbath Covenant. As you can see from the Dictionary of Christian Lore and Legend, it even says, it is known that the Greek names endings with S-U-S, S-E-U-S, or S-O-U-S were attached by the Greeks to names in geographical areas as means to give honor to their supreme deity, Zeus, which I just talked about, and that includes Jesus, and also Pegasus and Dionysus. Do you think it's a coincidence? No, it's not, because in the Greek, Isus literally translated means Hail Zeus. The name Jesus didn't even exist until the fourth century and was later a derivative of the late Latin Isus, which we talked about and saw in the 1611 version of scripture. And it goes on to say that the origin of Christianity by A.B. Trena even says the name of the true Messiah, Yahshua or Yahoshua, also known as Yahusha, being Hebrew, was objectionable to the Greeks and Romans who hated the Yahudim or the Jews. And so it was deleted from the records and a new name was inserted and was replaced by Isus or Hail Zeus which is now known as Jesus. So we see that the, what did they do? They took out the original names of Yahuwah and Yahusha and replaced them with the Greek variant of what? Isus which means Hail Zeus in the Greek. And this comes from the Gospel of the Kingdom True Names and Title from, from Dr. Henry Clifford Kenley back in 1931 of Ohio who says it is simply amazing to think that all these years, hundreds of years, Mankind has been calling the Savior by the wrong name. It's hard to give up the name of Jesus because it's so deeply ingrained in us and has been for much of that time in that name. And by the way, you may be saying, oh, but I've done miracles in the name of Jesus. Oh, but I've healed in the name of Jesus. I've used the name of Jesus and that name has worked. I've done miracles. We're going to go over that later on when we talk about the strong delusion. And I'm, gonna t I'm telling you this is some serious stuff. He also goes on to say, 
in the 1611 KJV, the name Yahusha appeared originally wherever the Messiah was spoken of. Yahusha means Yahuwah is salvation. Later, the Messiah's name was replaced with Isus, the Greek, which later in the 1600s, it became Jesus, starting with the new English letter J, because as we talked about with the letter J, it's the newest letter of the alphabet, which was introduced at that time. Further, the Greek Isus comes from the name Zeus, the ruling God in the Greek pantheon. So we already see that the name Jesus didn't come into existence. It's only 400 years old. And that in the Greek, what? The Isus means hail Zeus. So we have just looked up Jesus in the Greek and we see it means in the Greek Isus or Hail Zeus. And we also compared it with Pegasus and Dionysus and how they all have the same S-U-S on the end to give worship to Zeus literally. But now we're also here at Merriam-Webster because now we're going to look up what the word means in the Latin. And when you take the G-E-O root, because you can also pronounce this as Isus, but also Jesus, you can also pronounce Jesus as Jesus in the Latin. Latin, this is what you get when you take the roots and when you split the roots up together. Now, as you can see, the first root, you get the hay or the geo, which means in the simple definition is the earth, ground, or soil. And the full definition, according to Merriam-Webster, is earth, ground, or soil, as well as geographic, geography, and geopolitics. But what about the Seuss when you look up Seuss in the Latin? Well, when you look up the Seuss from Latin to English, the same Seuss that we see in the name of Jesus, this is what you get and this is according to latin dictionaries themselves the seuss definition comes from what it means hog pig or so it also means swine yes that is what seuss means in the latin so what happens when you put them together when you put the two together you get earth pig and that is what jesus means in the latin that is what jesus means in the latin it means earth pig i hope you are seeing it it's so important and we're going to talk about why this is so important and why you need to see it because when you put the jet and the seuss together in the latin that is what you get earth pig and that is exactly what it means that is exactly what it's talking about so when you call on the name of jesus you're literally calling on an earth pig this is why language is so important this is why the greek is so important this is why the latin is so important and this is why the hebrew is so important for those of you who still want to sit here and say that oh it doesn't matter oh we can call him whatever he wants oh he knows our hearts so we can call him by the english because that's the translation when we i've just gone over this in detail and we've just looked at all of this and you can even see that yes it means earth pig in the latin and hail zeus in the greek that is what the name jesus means in those respective languages pastor probably will not tell you any of this i wonder why that's the case your pastor won't tell you anything that i'm telling you today just like he probably won't tell you that tithing has nothing to do with money and giving your money to a pimp and pastor but everything to do with food but as you will see, you also see Seuss and the root of Seuss also in the Hebrew as well. And what you see in the Hebrew is that the Seuss means horse. And it means crane as the short definition, but it also means horse. And I'm here at Strong's Concordance at H5483. And in the Hebrew, yes, the word Seuss or that root Seuss means horse indeed. And we're going to go into detail more of that in just a second. Because now is the time to be deceived no more. You need to understand where salvation really comes from because Yahuwah and Yahuwah alone is salvation. And that is what the real Messiah's name means. Yahusha, Yah is salvation. But what about Jesus? It is invented by the hands of men because the Seuss in the Hebrew can even mean horse, which we just went over from. And as we have just seen in Strong's Concordance, H5483, but it also means Seuss, which is what pig and swine and hog and boar in the Latin as well. And it's time you see it and be not deceived. And you can also see that it comes from what? The Catechism of the Catholic Doctrine. They're the ones who changed everything. They're the ones who took out the original Hebrew names and replaced it with the earth pig known as Jesus. And that is exactly what it is. That is exactly who you're 
are calling on Jesus, earth pig. That is exactly what it means. It all stems from Roman religion. It all stems from the Roman Catholic Church, the beast system that gives power to the beast, which is what? The earth pig that is named Jesus Christ. And like I said, we're going to go over more of this in just a second. And once again, this is why language is so important. And I'm trying to reiterate that so that you can see why language is so important and where this name really comes from. Now I'm here at Yahuwah Kingdom. And the reason I'm here is because I want to give you more detail about this in the name Jesus and where it comes from. And it says that the name of Jesus is a mistranslation and mistransliteration of the Aramaic name Yeshua, which came out of the time of Babylonian captivity when the Hebrew name Yahusha was changed and shortened. And by the way, the Hebrew root Yeshu means to blot his name out or may his name and memory be obliterated. Because when you look at the acronym from the free dictionary, you see exactly that Yeshu means what may his name and memory be obliterated. And that is what Yeshua means. May his name be blotted out. That is exactly what Yeshua means. And we already went over Yahukanan or John chapter 5 verses 43 that the real Messiah, Yahusha, he comes in the name of his father. That is the name he comes in. Well, Yeshua doesn't have the Y-A-H in it and neither does Jesus, neither does Lord and neither does God. So therefore, those names cannot be correct. And this is why, once again, language is so important. So we also know that the name Yeshua, which means in the English, may his name be blotted out and it doesn't contain the Y-A-H root. We know that can't be the name of the Messiah either, Yeshua, but it also says that his name Yeshua was then translated into the Greek, which comes out as Isua or Isus, which was then changed to Isus to make it masculine, then translated into Latin under the name Isus or Hasus, which we saw in the KJV 1611 version, which I showed you, which was later changed again into the name Jesus about 500 years ago when the letter J entered the English language, which is the newest letter of the alphabet, which the letter J did not exist then and still does not exist in the Hebrew today. Another reason why language is so important. And it says ancient Hebrew before Babylonian captivity, Yahusha translates in English as Yahusha Strong's 3091. It says Yahoshua, which means Yahoo is salvation or Yahua is salvation, which means Yahoo saves. The modern Hebrew of Yeshua or Isus or the Latin Isus or Jesus is the English Jesus. And the Hebrew root Yeshu, of course, means may his name be blotted out and may his memory be remembered no more. So when you call upon Yeshua as the name of the Messiah, well, that means may his name be blotted out and remembered no more. And it goes through all of the changes that we have seen. The website then goes on to talk about the origins of Yeshua, but then it even says that the Heavenly Father, Yahuwah, did not leave us without witness of this grave error. The Greek form of Jesus being Isus is pronounced Jesus and can be found in the Hebrew writings. Jesus is a legitimate Hebrew word. Jesus transliterated into the Hebrew is Jesus, which is the hey in Hebrew means look, reveal, or breath, and the Seus in Hebrew, which means horse or beast. And the horse is a false hope for salvation, nor does it deliver any one by its great strength. And we even see that in scripture itself. We see reference to the horse, which is in Psalms 33, 17. He delighted not in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs or works of a man. And we see that in Psalms or Tehalim 147 verses 10 as well. Then we also go over the Latin, which means earth pig, which is the equivalent of a pig or a beast. He told us not to eat the pig. And the pig is the most abominable animal in scripture and even in the world itself. So then why do you think Jesus actually means that in the Latin? And as I've said, it's time you see the truth and be deceived no more and choose this day whom you are going to serve. And hopefully this video is a resource for you. And I'm going to leave all the helpful links below so that you can be deceived no more and see all of this on your own time. Now I'm here in Husha or Hosea chapter four, and we're going to be reading from verses six. And you'll see that it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject you, that you shall be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy Elohim. I will also forget your children. So you can see what that is the promise that Yahuwah has made. Because we reject knowledge, he's going to reject you and your children. He's already done that with the real children of Israel, who are the so-called African-Americans, so-called black people. But now soon it's 
it's going to be the nation's turns as well. Because we're also here in Yashayahu or Isaiah chapter 45. And like I said, today we're reading out of the 1611 KJV so you can get an idea of it. But it even says, assemble yourselves and come, draw near together ye that are escaped of the nations. And this is Isaiah chapter 45 verses 20, which also says, they have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven images and pray unto a God or an Allahim that cannot save. And what is that talking about? Wood of their graven images? Oh, just like wood and stone, just like the cross, praying to a God that cannot save, praying to Jesus who cannot save because only Yahuwah is salvation. Not to mention Psalms or Tahalim chapter 33 verses 17, which we just saw earlier, which says, a horse is a vain thing for safety, neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. So although he may have great strength and great signs and great wonders, you're able to heal in the name of Jesus and call upon that name. It is not able to save. It is a vain thing for safety according to scripture, as well as Psalms or Tahalim chapter 147 verses 10 that says, He is in our father Yahuwah, delighteth not in the strength of the horse or Seuss in the Hebrew, which is also where you see Jesus. He taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man or the invention of a man, which is where the name Jesus comes from, because you will not even see that name in scripture here in the 1611 King James Version. And I know you're probably still wondering, but I've healed and done miracles in the name of Jesus. I've done all these things in that name. Surely that has to be the name. And I'm here to tell you to be deceived no more because we're even going to go over that and we're even going to talk about that and see what scripture says about that and even see what our father says about that because scripture says that we are to call upon one name according to Oxim or Acts chapter 4 verses 12, which we will go over later on, but also that what whosoever calls upon his name shall be saved according to Yahuwah or Joel chapter 2 verses 32 Afsim or Acts chapter 2 verses 21 and Rumayim or Romans chapter 10 verses 13 and that one name is Yahuwah that's the name that we are to call on because Yah is salvation Yahuwah is salvation and his true son Yahusha that's what that name means that's what Yahusha means that Yah is salvation and that is the name that we are to call on upon. And like I said, trust me, this time try it. Just try calling upon Yahuwah and try call and try casting down demons in the name of Yahusha. And what you'll see is that those demons will be running faster than you can even pronounce the letter J in Jesus. I said, this is not to condemn anybody. This is not to make anyone feel bad, but this is rather to show you the truth and show you the hidden history that has been hidden from you and things that the Roman Catholic Church will not tell you and all of the things that they have done and all the horrid things that they have done and placed right in front of us but have kept hidden until today because real truth is being revealed to you today. Now I'm also going to be talking about the abomination of desolation and we're here at Bible Hub and as you see it says desolation. The Hebrew root for abomination is shakats or which means to be filthy, to loathe, or to abhor which is derived from shikuts or filthy especially idolatrous or anything to do with idolatry. And we also see the term spoken of in the Old uh, Covenant with Daniel, especially, or Daniel in the book, Daniel chapter 11, verses 31, and Daniel chapter 12, verses 11. And we also see it in other places in the Kings as well. And we... And we also see it too when Yahusha spoke of the abomination of desolation in Matit Yahu or Matthew chapter 24, verses 15, as well as Mark chapter 13, verses 14. Now, the abomination of desolation alludes to two different things. It's talking about a historical fact, and it's also talking about a spiritual event as well. So it's talking about two things. And the one that it's talking about from Daniel, or the book of Daniel, alludes to Antiochus IV and how he sacrificed a pig on the altar back in around 164 BC. You can read more about this in the book of Maccabees. If you would like more historical context, I highly recommend you do read the book of Maccabees, which is a book that they took out, a book that the Roman Catholic Church took out of the KJV, because as you saw earlier, it's actually in the 1611 version of KJV, but they took it out. I wonder why that's the case. 
Now, Bible Hub tells us, historically speaking, about Antiochus IV, and it says that he was the son of Antiochus III, who became king after his brother Seleucus IV, who had been murdered by Heliodorus. And notice how we see the word helio there to reference the sun. It's more sun worship back then. As a boy, Antiochus lived at Rome as a hostage. The the Pergamene monarchs, Eumenes and Attalus, succeeded in placing upon the throne the brother of Seleucus, although Heliodorus had wished to ascend the throne himself. The young king was even more enterprising than his father. He was called in to settle a quarrel between Onius III and his brother Jason, the leader of the Hellenizing faction in Yerushalayim or Jerusalem, and Onias was driven out. And this is according to 2 Maccabees chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. Then Jason became high priest in his stead according to second maccabees chapter 4 verses 9 to 16 and first maccabees chapter 1 verses 10 to 15 as well in here too and now it says antiochus himself afterward visited yerushalayim or jerusalem and was signally honored according to second maccabees chapter 4 verses 22 on the death of Ptolemy the sixth in 173 BC, Antiochus laid claim to Colas Syria, Palestine, and Phoenicia, whereupon war broke out between Syria and Egypt. In this war, Antiochus was victorious. Ptolemy of Philodomer was taken prisoner, and Antiochus had uh, himself crowned king of Egypt from 171 to 167 BC at Memphis, whereupon Alexandria revolted and chose Ptolemy's brother as their king. The Roman ambassador Papilius Lanius. Uh, demanded the surrender of Egypt and the immediate withdrawal from its self-constituted king. Antiochus yielded, gave up Pesulium, and withdrew his fleet from Cyprus, but retained uh, Colesiria, Palestine, and Phoenicia. But but the real abomination of desolation comes in where it talks about Antiochus IV and what he did in Yerushalayim or the insurrection of the Yahudim, also known as the Jews, and what he did. And Maccabees talks about his treatment to the Jews during this time because it says while Antiochus was on a second campaign in Egypt, he heard of the siege of Jerusalem. He returned immediately, slew many thousands of the inhabitants, and robbed the temple of its treasures. And this is according to First Maccabees Maccabees chapter 1 verses 20 to 24 as well as 2 Maccabees chapter 5 verses 11 through 21 by his prohibition of the worship and the introduction or substitution of the worship of the Olympian Zeus and we talked about that with the Zeus and how did he do that the, Ma the book of Maccabees also talks about how they got rid of the Torah and how they got rid of the Shabbat they got rid of the feast days they could no longer observe the feast days the Yahudim or the Jews could no longer circumcise the men or the boys Boys. I wonder why that's the case. He then brought about the insurrection of the Yahudim or the Jews under the Maccabees, upon whom he made an unsuccessful war in 167 through 164 BC. After this war, Antiochus retired to the eastern provinces and died after having failed in an attack on the Temple of the Sun in Elymais in Persia. So we see all the sun worship embedded as well, not to mention how he sacrificed a pig on the altar in Yerushalayim or Jerusalem, he actually did that. And we're going to talk about how that's not only the abomination of desolation, and that's what it's talking about the physical event, but it's also talking about the spiritual event too. And so the spiritual event of the abomination of desolation, spiritually speaking, is of course the Easter ham because it has to do with the pig, just like Antiochus IV sacrificed a pig on the altar in Jerusalem back in the 160s BC. So we even see it today. It's going Going on with the Easter ham and we even see the scripture talks about Easter and how our father Yahuwah does not like Easter or any of those pagan holidays and earlier in this video we even talked about Christmas and its pagan origins as well so we see that it is pagan in nature and our father doesn't like any of the holidays because what did the Roman Catholic Church do the B system they got rid of then they removed the seven feast days and they replaced them and added to scriptures by adding these holidays as well as their own feasts such as the feast of the epiphany and all those other ones that are all abominable and this is the spiritual event when you accept the earth pig jesus into your heart that is the abomination
Nation of Desolation as well, just like if you honor him on Easter Sunday, because newsflash, the real Messiah, Yahusha, was not resurrected on Easter Sunday. No, the Friday to Sunday, that's not even three days. I don't know where that relic comes from besides the lies of the Roman Catholic Church, but rather he was resurrected on the Shabbat. Our Messiah even says that he is sovereign or master or what you may call Lord of the Sabbath or Lord of the Shabbat. So he was resurrected on the Shabbat, not Sunday. Therefore, we do not have to be celebrating Easter whatsoever because we know it's abominable. We know it is not one of the seven feast days that is highlighted in Baikra or Leviticus chapter 23. It is not in the Torah. But don't get it twisted because Easter was also celebrated even before the Messiah was on the scene because we're here in Yarm Yahu or the book of Jeremiah and we're here in chapter 7 and we're going to be reading from verses 17 through 20 and it says seize thou not what they do in the cities of Yahuda or Judah and then the streets of Yarushalayim in Jerusalem and again no letter J there the children gather wood and the fathers kindle the father fire and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven that's talking about has cross buns on Easter and the pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, saith Yahuwah? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? Therefore, thus says Yahuwah Elohim, behold, mine anger and my fury shall be poured upon out on this place upon man and upon beast and upon the trees of the field and upon the fruit of the ground and it shall burn and it shall not be quenched. So as you can see, Yahuwah does not like Easter. Yahuwah hates Easter because it has to do with what? giving cakes and sacrificing to the queen mother of heaven and the earth pig or the Ishtar pig, which is what Jesus Christ himself, because it even means earth pig in the Latin. We even see the queen mother of heaven referenced again in Yarm Yahu or Jeremiah chapter 44 as well. And we're here in verses 17 through 19. And it says, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing go forth out of her own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Yahuda or uh, Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem or Yerushalayim for then we had plenty of uh, vitals and were well and saw no evil but since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine and when we burnt incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men and that's talking once again about Easter Easter and all the celebrations and pagan celebrations that go with Easter, offering the hot cross buns and the Easter ham and all that. Because what you do with Easter is that you cross out with the cross, you cross out salvation, which is Yahusha, the Passover lamb. So when you replace Easter with the Passover and we replace the Easter ham or the Easter pig with your Passover lamb, Yahusha, when you do that, you are in fact committing the abomination of desolation spiritually speaking because when you begin to follow the law statutes and commandments of our father that is spoken of in the mosaic law that is where you'll find salvation including the feast day including passover and accepting your true passover lamb the real messiah yahusha as well as using the restored set apart hebrew name for our father yahua in order to fulfill commandments and not break them and no longer be deceived no more but i know you're still wondering but i've healed in the name of jesus i've done miracles in the name of jesus I've seen signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Oh, scripture talks about this all right. And we're going to go over what's known as the strong delusion. And so we're here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going to be reading from verses 7 through 12 so that you can see it. And it says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom Yahuwah shall consume with the Ruach or spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming even him whose coming is after the working of satan with all power and signs and lying wonders okay and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved and according to scripture itself according to tahalim or psalms chapter 119 
verses 142, we see that the truth is the word of our father, Yahuwah. The truth is the law. His word is true. His law is true. And no, the law is not done away with. And we're going to go over that because even the real Messiah, Yahusha, even says that the law is not done away with. I know your pastor. I know your priest. I know your deacon. I know your bishop. And I know your reverend has told you that the law is done away with when this is not the case. And it even talks about the man of lawlessness but let's keep going and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved for this cause Allahim shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they might all be damned who believeth not the truth but had the pleasure of unrighteousness and that is exactly what it's talking about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3, where it talks about the man of sin and what the son of perdition, which, which is what the man that opposeth everything of our father and exalts himself above our father. And that's not just talking about the Pope, but that's also what? Placing man in front of our father, placing man in front of our creator, and that includes Jesus Christ, and which many have done. And and even when you say that, oh, the law is done away with, and oh, Jesus came to do away with the law, and oh, Jesus came to nail the law on the cross, even though we just proven with scripture itself earlier that the real Messiah was not only hung on a tree and had nothing to do with the cross, but he even teaches about the law, and we're going to go over that in a second. So no, the law is not done away with, that is just pure blasphemy. And when you go to church and tithe 10% of your income, even though that's not actually tithing, don't you think that's part of the law? Because it's even talked about and described in the law. The hypocrisy needs to stop now. But I'm here in Mati Yahu or Matthew chapter 7. And the reason I'm here is because Yahusha even talks about the great deception and he even talks about what's going to arise in the end times. He even says, not in verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, master, master, or sovereign, sovereign shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doth the will of my father which is in heaven and what is the will of the father following the law statutes and commandments the feast days the shabbats the dietary laws that are spoken of in leviticus or by Ecra chapter 11 and dabarim deuteronomy chapter 14 that is the will of the father and learning the law statutes and commandments returning to him using his true set apart name yah yahuwah and for his true son yahusha and accepting the passover over lamb Yahusha and not the Easter pig Jesus and it goes on to say verse 22 many will say to me in that day master master sovereign sovereign have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name have done one many wonderful works and that is what many people are going to do if they don't see the strong delusion now they're going to say oh oh when they when the Messiah returns they're going to say oh but we've done wonderful things in the name of Jesus we've done all these wonderful works in the name of Jesus we prophesied in the name of Jesus. But then will I profess unto them, then will the Messiah, the real Messiah, Yahusha, profess unto them, saying, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that worketh iniquity. Just like the iniquity that we talked about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 of deceit and deception, which is, of course, all religion, and that includes Christianity, Jesus Christ included, as you see here. Because I'm even here in Proverbs or Mishlai, where Shaluma also talks about the same thing. And we're here in Proverbs chapter 14, and we're here in verses 12, because it says, There is a way which seemeth right unto to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And that way, of course, there's a way that seems right. Christianity seems right. Islam seems right. It all seems right, doesn't it? Buddhism, it all seems right. Catholicism seems right. It all seems right. But is it right according to scripture? Is it right according to the word of our father, Yahuwah? That is the question we should be thinking about. Because I'm even here in Proverbs or Mishlai chapter 16, verses 25, that says the same thing. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And that is what I'm trying to get you to see today. Because in John or Yahukanon 14, 6, the real Messiah, Yahusha, says that he is the way, true, and the life. And what he's talking about is following what? The ways of the Father. Doing the will and work of the Father, which is what? Following the law, statutes, and commandments of our Father 
Father, following the Torah of our Father and getting away from all of the paganisms, getting away from religion and getting away from everything that man teaches, including Christianity. Even the Apostle Paul talks about the strong delusion as well because we're here in Galatim or Galatians chapter 1 and we're going to be going over verses 6 through 9. I recommend you read verses 1 through 9, but for the sake of time, we're going to be reading verses 6 through 9 in this chapter because even Paul or Shaul talks about the strong delusion. Yes, Paul, the one who you try to justify and say that, oh, well, Paul's writings say we can eat whatever we want. Oh, but Paul's writings say that we can do whatever we want. Oh, but Paul's writings say we can do whatever. Be not deceived and be deceived no more because this is some real serious stuff. Because our father is not playing around. Our father is not joking. It's time to decide and choose this day whom we are going to serve. But as for me and my house, we are going to serve Yahuwah. Now I'm here, verses six, and it says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the esteem of Yahusha HaMashiach unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the good news of Yahusha HaMashiach or gospel. Interesting. But though we, or a messenger, or angel from heaven, preach any other gospel or any other good news or any other doctrine unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel or good news message unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. And that other doctrine that he's talking about and that other gospel is the gospel of Jesus. Christ because I've already told you that the name of the real Messiah is not Jesus and that's a fact not only that but we even see that the Messiah's real name is Yahusha so when you preach so all the Christianity preaching Jesus Christ and preaching that the law is done away with and preaching that you no longer have to follow the law is a different gospel because what did they preach what did the Talmudim and the disciples preach what did the Messiah Yahusha preach they preached about the law and the Torah because newsflash there was no such thing as the New Testament during the time of Paul. There was no such thing as the New Testament during the time of the real Messiah, Yahusha. It had yet to be written. So what were they teaching from? They were teaching from the Old Testament, even though a lot of pastors and ministers like to say that we don't have to worry about the Old Testament because salvation is in the New Testament alone. How can that be? And how can you understand the New Testament without understanding the Old? How can you understand the end without understanding the beginning and how can you have a relationship with our father if you don't know his name and how can you be walking in the ways of Messiah if you don't even know the name of the real Messiah and if you don't even know what the ways of the Messiah really truly are. But Paul also talks about the strong delusion in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 through 6, which we see right here. He says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind shall be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Hamashiach, or Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another, what this says, Isus, or another Yahusha, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another Ruach, or another spirit, which ye have not received, or another good news message, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles, but though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. So what he's talking about is what? What is that other gospel that's being preached in Christian churches? What is that other gospel that's being preached in Christian doctrines and in Christian and dogma all over the place. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, even though I've just told you and given you the historical and the language side of what Jesus really means in the Greek and Latin, as well as the Christ and all the pagan similarities that are with Jesus and associated with Jesus. That is the other gospel that it's talking about because I've already told you and proven to you that the name of the real Messiah is not even Jesus because the letter J is not even in this scripture, but it's Yahusha. And what was he teaching? he was teaching the law, statutes, and commandments of our Father from the Mosaic Law.
because Shaul once again talks about the judgment of Allah and even talks about what professing themselves to be wise that they became fools and now we're here talking about the strong delusion once again in Rumaim or Romans chapter 1 verses 21 through 23 as well as verse 28 and it says because that when they knew Allah they they esteemed him not as Allah neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise they became fools and changed the esteem of the incorruptible Allahim into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things and how do we see that well that changing the esteem of our father to the image of man just like Jesus Christ and Krishna and Buddha and all the other ones into beasts like Horus and Ra and all those other sun deities oh is that what that's talking about of course it is and then it goes on to say in verse 28 and even as they did not like to retain Allahim in their knowledge, Allahim gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And that's exactly what happened, reprobate mind. And that's exactly what scripture talking about is talking about by saying, oh, well, we can still use the name Jesus even if we wanted to. We can still call upon the Messiah as Jesus and he'll be okay with it. We can break law, statutes, and commandments and we'll be okay with it. Our father will forgive us because he knows our heart. That is a reprobate mind that Paul is talking about. Because according to scripture itself, the name of our father will no longer be polluted anymore. And he even says that there's only one name that we can be saved by. And it's even in Acts or Obscene chapter 4 verses 12 where we find it because it says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And like I said earlier, if scripture was written in Hebrew and our father has a Hebrew name, name who can save then it would only make sense that we are to call on his Hebrew name not pagan titles such as Lord and God and not Jesus either because those names cannot and will not save as I've proven with scripture alone but we also see that too in other places in scripture too that his name will be polluted no more because I'm here in Yarm Yahu or Jeremiah chapter 23 and we're here in verses 26 through 27 that also talks about how his name will be polluted no more because what has happened the people have forgotten his name and replaced it for Baal which means Lord in Hebrew by the way and that's the name of our father but Ezekiel or Yakasko also talks about it in chapter 20 because in Yakasko chapter 20 verses 39 he says pollute ye my set apart name no more with your gifts and with your idols and of course that's talking about the pagan idols and he's talking about the children of Yashra all back then during the times of Ezekiel in the biblical times but we also see it in reference in Yakasko or Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 23 and he says and I will sanctify my great name which was profane among the heathen which ye have profaned in the midst of them and the heathen shall know that I am Yahuwah, saith Yahuwah Allahim, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. And we also see it again in Yakasko or Ezekiel chapter 39, verses 7, which says, So will I make my set apart name known in the midst of my people, Yashra, all their Israel, and I will let them pollute my set apart name no more, and the heathen shall know that I am Yahuwah, the set apart one in Yashra, all. In Salakia, it says, I will not let them pollute my set apart name anymore. So he will not let us pollute his set apart name anymore and that is what this channel is dedicated to doing restoring the set apart Hebrew name for our father Yahuwah and this restoring the set apart Hebrew name for our Messiah the son Yahusha then what is the good news? What is the real good news that Yahusha talks about? And what did he really come to do? And what did he really come to fulfill? And what are we supposed to do if we want to fulfill and inherit the kingdom of Shamayim or heaven? Well, scripture even tells us because we're here in Revelation or Hazun chapter 14, and we're going to be reading from verses 9 through 12. And it says, And the third uh, messenger or angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and we talked about the beast, in the Mark of the Beast video, which is what? The Beast is the Roman Catholic Church and all of those religions that the Roman Catholic Church is trying to merge together, Christianity included. And notice how it says, if any man worship the Beast and his image, and we talked about how the image of the Beast is Jesus Christ himself, and receive his mark in his forehead. And we talked about the Mark of the Beast and how the Mark of the Beast is anything contrary to our Father and the Mark of our Father, which is the Law, Statutes, and Commandments and keeping the Shabbat, 
in keeping the feast days or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of Allahim, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the set apart messengers and in the presence of the lamb. And verse 11, and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever rejoiceth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the Kadashim or saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of Allahim and the belief of Yahusha. So what does it say? Keep the commandments. Oh, which commandments is it talking about? Because Hazun or Revelation chapter 19 verses 20 also talks about the same thing. And it says, and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. Like I said back in 2 Thessalonians, the false miracles, the lying signs and wonders with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast or worshiping of the beast like the cross and the rosary beads and all those religious symbols, the Jewish star and the, the star and the moon and Islam, all of that. And them that worshiped his image, which is the image of the beast, which is not just Jesus Christ, but also Krishna, Buddha, Zoroaster, and all of them. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And that is exactly what that's talking about. And I know many of you are still saying, oh, but I've healed in the name of Jesus. I've done miracles in the name of Jesus. Like I said, now try doing it in the name of Yahusha. Try praying to our father, Yahuwah, and try casting out demons in the name of Yahusha, and you'll see how fast those demons will be running because they'll be running faster than you can even pronounce the letter J in Jesus. Now I'm here in Revelation or Hazun chapter 20 verses 4 through 6 that also talks about it and it says, and I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witnesses of Yahusha and the word of Yahuwah Elohim and which had not worshipped the beast neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and ran with Yahusha HaMashiach a thousand years, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And then it says, Baruch and set apart is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of Elohim and of HaMashiach and shall reign with him a thousand years. So you may be wondering, well, if Jesus Christ is not the answer, which I've just proven today, well, then how can we reign with Yahusha HaMashiach for a thousand years. Because Yahusha HaMashiach even tells us how we are to inherit the kingdom. Because I'm here in Yahukanan or John chapter 14, and we're going to be reading from verses 6 and 15. But it says, Yahusha saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But how can we do that? Well, it even tells us how do we love our Messiah. He even tells us in verse 15, If ye love me, keep my commandments. Yes, Yahukanan. Or John chapter 14, verses 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Which commandments is he talking about? Which commandments do you think he's talking about? Because remember, there was no New Testament written yet. So what commandments is he talking about? What commandments is he referencing from? And for those of you who still think that, oh, the law was done away with and we no longer have to follow the law, it's time to think again and no longer be under the reprobate mind and be deceived no more because even our Messiah, Yahusha, tells us that the law is not done away with because we're here in Mati Yahu or Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. And it says, think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled well the question is have heaven and earth passed away no they have not so therefore the law is not done away with because heaven and earth are still here but it goes on to even say that whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so just like Christianity and Catholicism teach he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven or Shamayim but whosoever shall 
shall do and teach them, the same shall be called the great in the kingdom of Shamaim or heaven. So not just do, not just teaching it, but also doing it as well. In verse 20, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees who follow their own laws and traditions, such as the hella days and such as, you know, doing their own laws and making up their own laws, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. But that is exactly what the Roman Catholic Church beast has done under the guises of Catholicism, Christianity included by telling you that the law is done away with, even though our Messiah tells us in this passage alone that he did not come to do away with the law or destroy the law or the prophets, but that he came to fulfill. And that is exactly what he did. So therefore, the law is not done away with according to Yahusha, our Messiah himself. Because scripture even tells you what the truth is. And here I am in 1 John or 1 Yahukanan chapter 2 verses 4. And it even says, He that said, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Well, that is exactly what your Christian church is doing when they tell you that, oh, the law's done away with. Oh, it was nailed to the cross. That's exactly what your pastor, your pimping pastor is doing and telling you when he tells you that the law is done away with, even though you're tithing to him, when you don't don't even know that tithing has nothing to do with money and everything to do with food. It's time to wake up and see what scripture itself says and see what the Messiah himself says because the truth will be revealed to you today. So in conclusion, what are we then to do? Now that we know the truth and now that we know the whole truth and nothing but the truth, what are we to do now? What are we to do in order to obtain salvation? Well, first of all, we are to use the set-apart restored Hebrew name for our father, Yahuwah, and his true son, Yahusha, our Messiah, our Passover lamb. And we are also to accept our Passover lamb, Yahusha, into our hearts because when we accept our Passover lamb into our heart, when we accept the blood of the lamb into our heart, Heart, we know we can be redeemed because he has redeemed us from the curse of the law as spoken of in Galatim or Galatians chapter 3 verses 13 to 14. But we have to accept Yahusha, the real Messiah, into our heart, the Passover lamb, as well as observe Passover and not Easter and no longer continue to put Easter over our hearts, but rather to put Passover and our Passover lamb. Because newsflash, the real Messiah, Yahusha, he kept the Shabbat, he kept the Sabbath, he taught the feast days, he preached from the book of the law, and he also ate the Passover meal with the Talmudim and the disciples. He ate the Passover meal, which is our Passover lamb, because he died in atone for the sins of Yashra all or Israel, which are those who follow the law, statutes, and commandments of Yahuwah. And that is exactly what our Messiah, Yahusha, has taught us, and that is what he expects of us as well. So no, the law is not done away with, and that is what we're supposed to do, is to learn the law for ourselves. So when we accept Yahusha, our true Passover lamb, into our hearts, the real name of the Messiah, that is where we can get salvation from because we know Yahuwah is salvation. And when we pray to Yahuwah and Yahuwah alone, that is where we will find our salvation. And when we start to follow his law, statutes, and commandments and keep his commandments and guard the Torah and guard it to, in our hearts, then that is where we know that we are getting salvation. No, you do not have to be Jewish in order to do this. No, you do not just have to be Jewish. No, you do not just have to be so-called black or African-American, the real biblical Israelites to do this. It is for anybody who is of righteousness and it is, it is of anyone who is seeking spiritual truth and wants to have a relationship with our father, Yahuwah, and his true son, Yahusha, and learn the law, statutes, and commandments. So in order to do that, you can start by reading the first five books of scripture, what is commonly known as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, or in the Hebrew, Barashith Shamud, by Ikra ba Midbar or uh, Dabarim, and not only that, but then you can also also check out some of my other videos where I also go over Torah truth. I'll leave those videos in the description box below so that you can see them. You can learn about the difference between clean and unclean foods, which is also mentioned in Leviticus or by Ikra chapter 11 and Dabarim or Deuteronomy chapter 14. So no more pork, no more shrimp, no more lobster, no more crab, no more shellfish, none of that, because there that is a commandment in Isaiah. 
Isaiah, Yahshua Yahu 66, also talks about the punishment of those that are going to be caught eating swine's flesh. And Yahuwah willing, I'm going to be doing a video on that as well, on pork and why we're not supposed to be eating it according to the law. Okay, so there's that. There's also the Shabbat, observing the Shabbat or the Sabbath day, the seventh day of rest, which is also talked about in Yakaskal or Ezekiel chapter 20. And I go over that too in one of my other videos that I'll link below, as well as learning the feast days and following the seven feast days that are mentioned of and spoken of in Leviticus or by Ikra chapter 23, which is Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles and learning them and getting them into our hearts. And like I said, accepting our Passover lamb who died on the Passover for us, Yahusha, who died and atoned for the sins of of Yashra all. That is some of the ways we can start as well as being charitable and learning charity and treating our neighbors rightly and equally and treating others with love, just like the love of the Messiah. And that is what I'm trying to do today is be a witness and, and show this. And that's why I'm doing this video. And that's why I've spent nearly three hours with you out of love because you need to know that Yahuwah is salvation. And through Yahusha, that is how you can be redeemed from the curse of the law. Hopefully this video has been helpful unto you. And hopefully this video has been a barakah unto you because like I said, when you accept Yahusha HaMashiach into your heart, that is where you'll start to find salvation. And when you start to pray to our father Yahuwah, and when you know that Yahuwah and Yahuwah alone is salvation, because that is what the name of our Messiah means in the Hebrew, that is where you will find salvation. And also following the law, statutes, and commandments, as I've talked about, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me and I'll leave the helpful videos below so that you can start your journey into truth and so that you can no longer cross out salvation with religion and Christianity and Jesus Christ and so that you will no longer be deceived and be deceived no more. Hopefully this video has helped you. Hopefully this video has shown you the truth and nothing but the truth and hopefully you see it with both your eyes open because the truth has been revealed to you today. This is Truth Unveiled here saying peace, love, and as always, shalom.